Hey, 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 everyone. Turn on the machines. We're here again. This time I paused for a week because I wanted to make sure all of you caught up this special evening edition, afternoon, evening edition, some of those around the world. And I always like to give a little few minutes before I bring up this special guest that we have, a true New Yorker in every way, a Boricua. And very proud of his heritage and proud of his accomplishments as we were talking off camera. And, you know, but before I get to that, I just want to ask you all if you can send positive thoughts to our friend who was on the show as well, Kathy Brown. She went through two surgeries and she's, you know, she's taking care of herself. She's doing the best she can, but you know what? Positive prayer always helps. And let's send all the positive energy to our girl, Kathy Brown, to come back stronger, better than ever, and we love her, you know? Because um, I find when all the prayer angels come out, all the prayer warriors, for some reason, somehow, miracles happen. And I want that miracle to bestow on our lovely Kathy Brown because she is a doll and one of our veterans in house music as to, and what a powerful voice. So now that I see everybody's getting comfortable, welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of Nueva York, a town that's created some amazing talent and also a town that can eat you up if you don't know how to play it right. But to say the least for this gentleman who's been doing this for decades is an understatement. Now, let me tell you how much of a true iconic person he is, okay? When you have a group that sells in the excess of six and a half million to seven million copies, that's multi six to seven times platinum. To me, that defines a generational change. Because pre to that, remember, pre to that, there was nothing that crossed into pop world from dance music, okay? Because it always starts somewhere. It starts in a sweaty, dark club, people dancing, and then normally from an underground situation, some records sometimes cross over and hit that little box at the, in the day, the radio, and explode. But with this guy, he helped shape a few of our people, our peers, and helped get them into the system and in the business through his accomplishments and also his testing of, you know, working it from the turntables, going to become a remixer, and then actually becoming the producer, writer, and so forth, the artist, all the above. Not many could say that, you know, or say, I was there when, before this was done as a de facto, like now you hear it all the time, a particular way of how acapellas are slammed into drums and things. In those days, all the experimentation was done with these guys. They were doing it and they were blessed enough to be able to get it onto records and for DJs around the world to play them. You know, that's, that's an understatement. And then for it to become the de facto, so that it's that damn good. What these guys are doing, we call it, you're copying some of the best out there. You know, I've always talked about it. Shep Pettibone doing his thing with the claps and the way he was doing his mixes and such and such doing that thing. But in the days of, of the 80s and 90s, as this thing was shaping up, and now you're hearing that particular sound now done as the formula. They were there in the lab creating the formula that is now used all the time. And it goes on and on. And I'll tell you another thing. This man was involved in the Bodyguard soundtrack album. Now, mind you, this sold in excess of over 45 million copies. 45 million copies. All of you fighting to have a number one on track source? <laughs> Imagine that, brothers and sisters and children of the dance world. 45 million effing copies. That's to me success. What do you you can hate him, 
You can love him. You can loathe him. But you cannot say it didn't happen. These things happen. Grammy winner, American Music Awards, Billboard, all from the barrio, with not a nickel in his pocket to that level of success. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Mr. Robert Clavillis. <laughs> Yo, you almost put a tear in my eye there. What's going on? It's the truth, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Can't put it any more than that. People need to know. We need to set that record straight. That's why this show was created to hear your voice and hear all of you tell us how this all transpired and how you were able to be blessed. Because I always say it's a blessing. Because you can have great talent. You still have to be blessed to be picked for this game. It is. You were blessed. No Absolutely. matter how hard you work, you still were blessed. Absolutely. That's That's for sure. You know, I don't want to take that away because we know, and you know this as well as I know, there's a lot of talented people out there never get a scratch to get a chance. And then there's some people who basically don't have no talent and you sometimes ask, how's that happen? But, you know, it goes like, it's never, it's never fair, but it is what it is. So welcome to the show, my brother. And I know you do not do interviews, especially like this, but <laughs> Gracias. I haven't done one in a long time. It's got to be like 15 years. Thank you. You hear that, everyone? Because everybody's saying Robert Cavillis is coming on. Like he's coming it's on. Been he's like 15, it's been like 15 years. And but this is it. This is the true house stories. That's right. And there's another reason why he's coming on because he is a machine. Still, no matter what he tells you, he's in the middle of getting ready to do a documentary. So he's going to mention about it. And there's some questions that all of you've been asking me to ask. He may not answer, so don't get pissed off with him. I'm telling you right now, because Robbie tells as it is, but he wants you to watch his doc. So that's important. But we're going to get the story of when young Robbie from 27th Street in that area downtown, Low East Side. Lo even Lowe's before area. then, even before then, 116th Street and 5th. Thank you. We're gonna get yeah. We're gonna get even a little. We're gonna go a little further back to those days. So, so because I, I want to get right into this because I know you got a lot to tell us. Mm -hmm. Robbie, how's music find you as a young kid? Music finds me on thirteen eighty seven Fifth Avenue Taft Projects on the eighteenth floor as a young kid sitting down. Uh, his mom's love salsa music, always dancing, always playing it in the in the living room. And then those were the days of WABC, 99X, and WBLS. So you got a little kid sitting down with his radio, going from the AM to the FM and listening to everything. Soft rock, hard rock, R&B, you name it. I loved it. Um, my family comes from a background of music as well. My uncle was in a trio. Uh, he sang doo-wop. And uh, music was always around. So I knew from that age, and I probably, I'm going to say I had to be like six or seven, that I was, either, I was going to be in some type of creative environment, clothes, music, or movies. That was what caught me, and that's what I felt was normal for me. You know, some people have that just sixth sense feeling of this is it, and from that young age, uh, it was going to be one or the other. Oh, Soul Train, American Bandstand on TV. So, you know, it, it was everywhere. It was all over. So 24-7, music. So were you actually musically inclined with any instruments or vocal instruction or anything that you at school when you were coming up? My stepfather uh, taught me the violin. So I was on that for about a year, year and a half. But grew to hate it because it was more forced upon me than me choosing an instrument. Um, I always sang around the house, but my mother once told me, if that's what you want to be, you better pick something else. <laughs> so it kind of hit me, you know what I mean? But I learned from her saying that, that I was the type of individual that when someone said that to me, I was going to figure out a way. It didn't break my heart. You know, because my mother brought me up to be a serious person. She was a serious person. She was always working. We had six kids in the house. 
uh, the only woman taking care of us. So she was busy. You know, she would get up, get us dressed, take us to school, go work full time, come out, pick us up, dinner, put us in bed. And I remember from a, I had to be like five, sitting in the bed, just watching her getting back on the machine to do overtime and work. So she was busy taking care of us and never really said, I love you. You know, I don't remember ever seeing that. So that serious look and that serious approach on surviving. That was what became uh, my main ingredient as a, as a character. But I knew she always loved me because every time someone invited us somewhere, she said, my kids have to come, you know, and, and the way she took care of us. So you grow up and you realize that uh, there's different ways of being loved. You know, sometimes it's verbally, but she was pure action. But she ingrained that go get it vibe, you know, do by any means necessary, make it happen. So when you were all you as children home, who was playing the mother and father? Because, you know, who's the, you have the oldest siblings? Is that how it was? I'm the oldest. On? I was the oldest. Okay, so you were handling the fort? Yeah, I watched her get pregnant, have another one, get pregnant, have another one. So I was always the oldest. But my mother was my father and my mother at that time. She played both roles. And she was no joke at it, <laughs> you know? Um, and then my uncle came into the picture when I was around 13 years old and he became my best friend as we grew up. Yeah, because everybody always needs that one person, this family member or friend that actually takes the position of being like a godfather in a sense. Yeah, but it was my mother. You know, I got I definitely gotta give my mother the, the hat to that. She was my mom and dad for for most of my life. So she truly played the heifer in the game. Yeah, she played it both. You know, mother, father, sister, brother, everything. Kick everything. your ass, be the disciplinarian, and also the one that be your worst critic as well, and the loving one, you. Too. And the one that protected me, yeah. So, because yeah. that's the hardest thing to be the worst critic, love you, and all that, and still be somewhat bipartisan, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I grew up with her having that serious face. So I have that serious face, you know, that whole, Rob, you okay? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. But, uh, Focused. I've always been focused. As a young kid, I've been focused. That's what she taught me, to stay focused. Did mom come, actually, is she born in, in here in New York, or she came from Puerto Rico? My mother was born in Puerto Rico and came as a newborn here. I don't know how what age. And my father was full Puerto Rican. He was fully from Puerto Rico. He ended up moving to New York when he married my mother. Yeah, because that was a different time in the 60s. Than yeah, that's the time everybody was coming down and, and moving into Harlem which became Spanish Harlem. Right. Or Washington Heights, Spanish Harlem area, Dominicans, Spanish Harlem was more Puerto Rican based. Yeah. Up from Washington Heights is more Dominican. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. So of course you, the violin went to the side, the voice, mom said, Gaete, close that down. Yeah, she was, she was pretty raw. I mean, I didn't shut up, but you know, I just didn't do it around because I didn't want to be criticized anymore. <laughs> well, what were you imitating? Because everybody's listening to the radio in those days. Like, what I mean, if I was on WABC, I was singing soft rock. If I was on 99X, it was the crossover station. And BLS was that soul. So, you know, you, you're just singing along. I, but one thing that caught me that I definitely remember as a young kid, I listened to the arrangements. You know, a lot of people just listen to songs and sing along, but I was listening to the, the string sound, the piano, the bass, and, and listening to all the different changes and all that. So I was learning that right from the radio. I remember that to this day. Okay. So now we get through into high school years. Uh, I, I think before high school, right? I'm, I'm trying to figure yeah, out. You're down, you're still, you're talking about when you're really young. So now we're talking a little bit. So when I got my first turntables? Yeah. I don't know the year. But I know the first record, my mother helped me buy my equipment too. I remember because I, I saved a hundred dollars packing uh, groceries in the supermarket and she put in the rest and we got SL, SLD 100s. Is that correct? The name of them? Techniques? I SLD. Think they were direct drive. SLD, yeah. Yeah, I think they wore that with the, with the Newmark mix, I think it was. She helped me pay for that. And my first mix was King Tut the Third. And rap is delight. So that's the year kind of when those records were new. That's kind of the year that I started spinning. Okay. So 
did you see anyone that showed anything to you or you just, how did you know to put this thing together? What was? Well, I moved from Spanish Harlem and I moved to, hey, I think it was 13 or 14, right? Because had to be 14, 15. Anyway, I'm always off with my age, so don't get me on the age. But I moved to 28th Street between 2nd and 3rd. And on 24th Street, I believe in 2nd Avenue, I might have the street wrong. There's Fibs Projects. So walking down there, you, you I heard a window. It was either the third or the fourth floor. The window was open. And I saw this dude bouncing. And I would listen to him spin because he had his window open. He later became to be known Tim, as Timmy Regisford. So I used to listen to Timmy play. And um, I remember going, yeah, that's what I want to do. You know? And um, there's another guy by the name of Louis Rivera that was also playing. He's Puerto Rican. I loved his long mixes. He was known for the long mixes. He would stay there with the record, with the two records, with these, you know, minute long mixes. And they just sounded beautiful where Timmy was just rocking. So they had both different styles, but I fell in love with both of them. So I used to look at them because they were a little older than me. And uh, and that they, they were the they were the first inspirations of playing. And my uncle, Andre Carrera, who lived in Fibs as well, he let me use his turntables before I brought mine. So I was DJing before I See, got See, my... I knew it. I knew somebody let you touch their stuff. I said, because cool. Yeah. He lived in Fibs and he had the real deal. And I was like, oh, what did he have? Up. What did he have set up? You know, I don't, it's it's been a long time, but he had the real deal. I don't know if the SP, I don't know if the 1200s were out then, but he had what, he didn't have the SLD ones, but he had the, the better ones. So whatever they were using at that time, he used to have a pitch control. That's the original 1200s. So then he had the 1200s in his the original house. Original 12s with the little, the little yeah. pot, the little round pot. I'm just trying to remember because I was, I was young, but he would let me go up. So I would go to his house and, and start spinning. So before I got my turntables, I was DJing already, but, um. That was the inspiration to me, Regisford, Louis Rivera. Now, did your uncle actually show you this is how you do yeah. and, 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 and count the records out? Like like how the BPM, not BPM, but how 4-4 four, four timing and don't mix vocals over vocals. Did he tell you any of that? Or you just... I mean, he was explaining it to me, but I already in my head kind of was already knowing what I had to do. You know, that was the thing, just listening you know, listening to Timmy and watching him bounce, you know, that already gives you the, the, the count. You know what I mean? So Was Timmy on BLS at this stage or this is before BLS Master Mix? I'm going to have to say it might be before that. It might, be way, it might be way before that, you know? You know, because I was young. And it was the 80s, early 80s. Because in the early 80s, John Morales was on the BLS. And the Eminem Mix, yeah. That's right, with Sergio yeah. Munzabai, so... Everybody was listening back then to them. Yeah, that was later on. Timmy comes in a little bit later. Yeah, it was definitely before that because I was young. Okay, so your uncle's showing you the way. So you get mom, mom gets you to turn tables with you. You guys, did you go to Pinky's father's place to buy them? <laughs> that he said that store, Leonard's over there where the World Trade Center was. I'm gonna say I don't remember where it was, but it was downtown. Cause they used to, everybody seems to buy their turntables from Pink Ray Pinky Velasquez's dad. Yeah, everybody went to go to Leonard's whatever Leonard's Electronics. That's what only place that had these turntables back then. If that was the only place, then we ended up there because I know it was downtown. It's probably the same place. <laughs> probably same place. Yeah, we got a great price for them. I remember he he hooked us up. Yeah, this is pre everybody. This is pre Canal High Fire and all that time. This is like early. These guys are dinosaurs here. Way back. Way back, back into time. So, yeah. all right. So you, you you're going through the whole high school thing, and where'd you go to high school? Tell me. I went to four different high schools. Why? I went to Palm Memorial for freshman year. Second year, I think I went to Puerto Rico. It was either the second year or the third year. I took geometry. That's how I know. I don't know what year geometry is, but I took geometry in Spanish. So I was in Puerto Rico. And then I went to Chelsea's Boys Electronics High School in the West Side. So that was either sophomore or junior, you know, whichever one you could flip it. That's where I met my classmate that I didn't know was in the music industry. Or I don't know if he was in the music industry at that time, but I was sitting behind him and I always used to talk him to death. He always used to give me that look like, all right, already. But we used to talk and he was in the martial arts. I remember that. And his name is Albert Cabrera from the Latin Rascals. So... He was, he was my classmate in Chelsea. And then I finished school 
So yeah, I had to be proud because I finished school in Seward Park on the Low East Side. That's where I graduated. And I was already going to the Paradise Garage. Hang on, everybody. Albert Cabrera later becomes Tony Moran's partner and the Latin Rascals are, 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 are formed. So let's get our, this is all the people that are in school together hanging. And just so you know, those you just joined the show. Yeah. yeah, Robert Cabrera's. Great. Yeah, Robert Cabrera's. Pretty cool dude too, Albert. Gentleman. Sweetheart, very good guy. And uh, so those were the four high schools that I went to. <laughs> Did you wind up using none of this geometry, of course, and none of that stuff? You just. <laughs> and I used it in running my businesses now in the last few years, of course, but uh, no, not for making music. But at the time when you were in high school, this type of thinking of a career in music was probably not anything in, in mind. What were you thinking about going to become? Because everybody's dreaming about what they're going to be firing. It definitely was in my mind. It definitely was in my mind because I was already DJing. You know, I had been DJing for a while already, um, doing parties, you know, house parties. Those were the days where you had to take your turntables, your speakers, your crates, and you had to go from house to house. So I would play anywhere and everywhere we could as a young kid. Um, where I made the where I made the dive into the music industry, I remember because I was nervous to tell my mother. It was freshman year of college. Um, I did my first year and I told her I'm not going back. But that was because of my experience while I was a freshman in college. I took business management and a project that we had in business management at that time, it was the Borough Man Community College. They gave, they put us into groups in the class and they said, we're going to give you $500 we want you to build something. It was a business project. Build, come up with a business. And I remember with my crew, I talked them into Let's Rent Studio 54. So we took the $500. We got a meeting with Studio 54 at that time. And we said, we're doing a college project. And, you know, the guy had a humor, you know, these high school, you know, uh, freshman year, we're young, we're kids. And he said, well, we can only give you a weekday. And we were like, we don't care what day you give us. And we came up with this plan. They said, keep your $500. It's a school project. You know, we're going to let you have the night. And we were excited. You know, I never played in a real club yet. So we took the $500. We made invitations. We said, let's let all the girls in free. Because wherever the girls show up, everybody else is going to show up. Um, so out of that $500, we packed the place uh my first time playing so i was excited i was killing the crowd that's where i met john fair for my first remix too that's where i first was introduced to him playing in that party so i got my first connection in my first party with my first college project hang on did they have the thorns turntables or were you playing on 1200s you know i don't remember oh you remember thorns bro you know, i know the thorns i know the thorns but you know what it is it's been so long ago because yeah. I know the Thor and Third Tables, what they're like, and I know what the 1200 is like. It's, oh, my God. Yeah. It's a nightmare if you don't play on them. Yeah, All I right, so. I didn't have a nightmare, so it might have not been the Thorns. Just probably the 1200s, but it's okay. But I was so excited that I was going to rock at whatever turn. You didn't give a crap. They gave you Fisher Price, right? Nah, at that moment, it wasn't. I was going to just kill it. You know, that was my How important play. was it for you to play in New York City? Tell everybody oh, that. On. I mean. You're talking about a freshman in college getting his first shot at playing on the Studio 54? Come on. That's the more, one of the most exciting things in the world. And then you're going to play for everybody your age group, and the place is packed? I mean, we packed the place. We packed it so much that we ended up giving uh, a few thousand dollars to the college and kept a few thousand dollars, and everybody in the group used that money, and we all went to Puerto Rico for the week. That's how good we did on our first night and passed our, our our business management college course. <laughs> but I met John Fair there, too. Um, he's the... Uh, Tell song. people who John Fair is, exactly. John so, Fair yeah. was signed to Sleeping Bad Records, and he had two artists that were popular. Chocolate, Easy Street Road, and the song that I worked on with him, which was my first remix um, that he got he hired me for from meeting me at Studio 54, and that was Dar Braxton Jump Back. That was my first record that I worked on. Um, and that was a great remix and it was a good time. And it was the first time that I was able to sit and do anything that I wanted. So I created the break, the jump, 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 wait, jump, wait. jump, jump, wait. jump. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. 
How do you know to do in the studio when you've never done any studio stuff previous? Like, where does this all begin for you? Tell us that. Now, come on. Yeah. She, I know uh, Rick Caviano says, fake it till Pharrell, you make it. You've always heard that, but I want to hear you. I know that Pharrell's always says that he sees music, and I could understand that because I could do the same thing. You know, you just visualize and you uh, watch. And I had gone to the studio with Louis Verrera. He was working on this song called Please Don't Go With Naomi. And he invited me to the studio. And it was his, and I remember his engineer. His engineer's name was Jim Banzai. He had this little tail in the back. And Louis told me, I'm going to let you come in, but you got to sit down and be quiet. I said, you're not even going to hear a peep. And I sat in back of the studio and I remember I watched everything Jim was doing. I learned the mutes. I learned the slides. I learned their language as I was sitting there just listening to them. Give me a little more bass. Give me a little more low end. I need some high mids. And I just stood to the side and listened to the sonics. And I was able to learn just from being quiet in the back. And I took what I learned there with my instinct in INS and did the very same thing. You know? And you know what? You know the saying, fake it till you make it? Well, that's why I said Ray Caviano always said that to me. Always. Right? So I faked it, but I had education in it from listening. Well, know? that's what I'm asking because unless you, I'm, I'm going to assume Jim Bonze worked on that jump back with you? No, I don't think Who it was, was the Jim engineer. Bonze. I don't remember the engineer. It was INS. That was where uh, Larry LeVan's keyboard player was an engineer. He didn't work on the session, but I did meet him there. And I recognized him from. Uh, uh, oh no, it wasn't the keyboard player. But that's Michael the better. It's the guitar player, Robert. Got his Glasper, last name. Robert Glasper or Robert. Uh, he, was the, he was the blonde haired guitar player. Yeah. So he was engineering IS. I met him, but he wasn't the engineer. I don't remember the engineer. So that guy worked with you, the engineer. So the engineer was basically at that point. He was an INS engineer. Yeah, he was a, just a. So star. you came in with your ideas and said, this is what I, what I want to do. And yeah, I sat down with John. He took me to his house. Um, he played me the record. And I, I started taking some notes. So I had my notes of what I wanted to do. And when we went into the studio, we he, he played keyboard, so I gave him a line. So I sang him a line and he did it. And then that DJ thing came out. I was like, you know what would be dope? You know, we got to create this big break. So if you hear Dar Braxton, it's the whole record. But in the break, I said, we got to throw a nice reverb on the drums and then do the emulator. And that's how the whole boom, when you listen to the record, that break has that boom, 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 boom with the jump. Yeah, jump I can't jump. believe, cause you, you're so, you, right now you're very experienced. Right now, you're, you've are you been a thousand years making records. I bet you didn't say it like that. You're probably explaining it how you wanted it, right? Yeah, no, I told you. You wouldn't say the technical terms, you just started. Well, I knew what reverb was. Remember, I was sitting down watching Louis and Jim Banzai, and you learn what a reverb is. Because That's all I want you to talk he about. Turns, he turns it on, and you hear the space and all that. So I knew, you know, one thing about me, if anybody knows me, is that my concentration level is straight, focused, 100%, and I listen and learn right on the spot. You know, if I hire a lawyer, I don't hire a lawyer to do my contract. I hire a lawyer to teach me how to do the contract, to teach me the law. And then I come up with the remix of what that law is and say, hey, can we do this? And he goes, yeah, we can do that. So in every single thing, my accounting, every single thing, that's the way I am. And that's the way I was with music. I'm learning. I'm listening to what he says. He says reverb. Okay, now I hear the sound change. I'm listening to bass. Whoa, I can hear the speaker. So I'm learning that as I go. You know, so when I went into INS, I knew what a reverb was because I learned it from that session. You know, now trying to find the right reverb sound, that's different. That's when the engineer says, what kind of reverb sound you want? And then I go, I don't know. Let's hear all of them. Right. And you sit there and that's where you start doing and clicking. And that's where you get, that's the one right there. All right. Can we make it shorter? He goes, yeah, I can make it shorter. So, you know, that's how it comes about. So you're thinking like what you heard at studio and you I've, I want it to be either large or I want it you know, tight. You, you, you're right. telling I'm me. I'm taking my DJ from playing already at home thousands of hours, right? Because when you're a DJ in those days, we played every day, all day. We got up, we ate breakfast mixing. We ate lunch mixing. Everybody else was playing basketball, but you're home with your reel-to-reel -reel playing, spinning, you're in it. I played, I played so much that at nighttime, I would put my headphones, open them up against the windowsill, not to wake up my mother, and dj through the headphone, listening to it and spinning with my hands. That's how much I loved spinning.
ladies and gentlemen, that's called passion. Yeah. Passion to want to be great at something. Right. I mean, I played so much that a cop knocked on my door one day to say, I, you, we're getting a noise complaint. I said, who are you getting a noise complaint? Your mother called. So my own mother calls me for DJ. So, you know, I'm a very passionate person. When I put my focus on something and I love it, I want to be the best at it. And that's been since the beginning, you know, that's I, since I can remember. So that Dar Braxton, I was ready for the Dar Braxton, you know? Now tell me. Tell me what it felt like. That's your first remix. Oh, man. And Larry LeVan and the garage and everybody is playing this record because I used to hear it all the time. Like, Well, it almost didn't get played in the garage because I was so excited. I was already a dancer in the garage. So going dancing, my cousin took me and all that. So when you do your first remix, you're excited. And who wouldn't want Larry LeVan to play that record at that time? I mean, that was Oz, right? You know, that was Oz. Um, so I almost made a mistake because I was so excited. David Deplino used to open up for Larry. So it was, I went, I showed up early when nobody's on the dance floor, you know, doors opened up and I ran there and I, and I took the white label copy, the test pressing, the mastering. And I went to David Deplino and said, hey, check this out. And he listened to it. He said, oh, wow, this is dope. And he played it that night. Well, anyone that knows the garage and knows Larry LeVan, Nobody plays a record before Larry LeVan plays it. And David played it. So he was really like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I had apologized. I went upstairs and I apologized. I said, listen, you know, I'm young. I'm excited. Da -da -da. And Larry cracks a smile and says, okay, don't worry about it. Well, it took him about two or three more weeks before he played the record. But when he plays it, it's a special thing because he just killed it. And we all talk about that, that, that feeling. Oh. It's, it, it, no matter how many great things you've accomplished, that was probably one of the greatest moments here. Oh, the here. Paradise Garage was my uh, university, right? I call it the university. Um, that was where I learned Sonic for real. You know, I would sit in the middle of the floor. I would sit behind the speaker. And you can hear every single thing in that club. And that just made me really sharpen my skills, you know? That was my university, he was the professor. You know, David DePino, Larry LeVan, you know, at that time, they were the ones, right? Um, it's, it's one of the best, actually, I've won so many American Music Awards, Billboard Awards, MTV Awards, and Grammys, that it doesn't top Larry LeVan one day DJing in the world after the Paradise Garage, and he's playing another record that I did called Notice Me. And he turns around and looks at me, says, come here for a second. And I went over it. He said, you see that record? He said, that's the Paradise Garage. And that one moment beats a lot of big moments in my life. And people don't understand it, but I'm like, I don't think you understand this something. I grew up and this was my passion and this was school. And the dream of every DJ to play that room. <laughs> Yeah, I never got to play in it. I probably would have gotten to play with it if uh, it stood open, you know, because by then I was making a lot of records and, you know, um, I was, uh, we were cool, you know. Um, I had a great experience with Larry after the after the, the, the Paradise Garage. You know, that was a real moment for his days. But when he left the Paradise Garage, I was booming, you know. And he would hang out in Fr Francois Kevorkian's studio, uh, Axis. And you can see in his eyes that things changed for him. But I had a moment to pay it back. And I sat him down in my room with the records I played and sat down and said, if you ever want to do something, you know, come on, let's get it done. And he really appreciated that. You know, he appreciated those conversations because there was a lot of people that when the garage stopped, right, a lot of people walk away. They're your best friends, and a lot of people walk away. But I had a great time with him after that, you know? It was a shame well, that... Well, because, like, she was the queen of her castle. She didn't do such nice things to a lot of people, and there was a lot waiting for, as they say, the Wizard of Oz to come falling down. <laughs> and they were praying for her to come down. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I, I understand where you're going with that, but that's a whole other story. But it's yeah, like that's a whole, you know, everybody, you know, one thing in life, 
everyone makes mistakes. You know, everyone makes a mistake. Let the first person that's never made a mistake throw the first stone. <laughs> Who's gonna put the stone up? Anyone? Keep quiet. Sit down. Sit. sit everybody, sit down around. Right. Me. All right, we could sit down and talk about that. Shit, one, I made a ton of mistakes. One thing, one thing that I've learned is the way you value people is always look at their good side, their good qualities, because everyone's gonna have a bad day. Everyone's gonna do something regrettable, right? But we're supposed to learn out of it, you know. Um, so to me, Larry. He might have made a lot of mistakes, but so do we all, you know. Um, I appreciate that he was one of the best. I appreciate that he taught me how to perfect sound on record, right? Just listening to him, listening to the sonics of the room. Um, that I had the passion to translate that into the records we've made, quality, to be at its best. From Studio 54, where do you start playing in New York? Well, I played Studio 54 and I was in college, so I started remixing. The Dar Baxter record was for Sleeping Bag. So that's my first remix. Larry's playing it. I get the credit. I'm working in the mail room of Sleeping Bag at that time when Sokolov had hired me. I crack open the first box of Dar Braxton commercials ready to be sold to the stores. I look at the credit and I didn't get the credit I was supposed to get. I was supposed to get a digital production and remix by Robert Clavillis. It's your first record. It's the one that's going to open up your career and start it all over. And I look at the credit go, I'm not going to get no work from this. It looked like assisted by, I forgot what it was, but it was just assisted by Robert Clavillis. And John Fair walks in because it's his record. So he's coming in to see the boxes and all. I say, hey, John, can I talk to you for a second? And he goes, sure. And I showed him the record. I said, man, I'm not getting the credit I was supposed to get. I really worked hard on this record. And he said, you're not satisfied with what you got? I was like, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that this is a big record. I kind of co-produced it with you, and I'm not asking for that. Just want the additional production that I was responsible for. I mean, the technique of that break with the reverb and all that, that's pretty groundbreaking. you know. And, and, and no one's going to know it's me. He starts screaming in the mailroom and runs out. Talking about the word you use, queen. <laughs> William Sokoloff walks in. He says, what happened? I said, all I did was ask him about the credit. He says, well, he's screaming out there that you try to beat him up, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, how am I going to beat him up? I'm in the mailroom. I'm working. He said, well, he's making a big thing. At the end of the day, William says, hey, take a walk with me. And he says, you know, I like you, right? I was like, well... <laughs> he goes, he said it's either him or you. And you know he's had a hit already with chocolate. And now he has a hit with Dog Braxton. And I'm like, Will, don't do that. You know, um, you know that I worked on this record. Um, you hear the talent, you're the boss. You can say no. He says, Rob, I got a contract with him, but I'm going to buy you SP 1200. I said, I don't want SP 1200. No, no, I want to buy you SP 1200 because I want you to continue your career. And I said, Will, you're going to regret this day one day. You chose the wrong person. <laughs> so we all know whatever, what happened to Sleeping Bag and we know what happened to Colin Clavellis. So I've, I've been joking with Will most of his life about it. Yeah. I would say it's about right. <laughs> so from there, you get shit canned from <laughs> as as um, which is a good thing. Sometimes I always say one door closes, another door opens. I know, but in those days, you know, it's hard. You know, Tell everybody what that was like back then. Well, you know, uh, well, it, you know, it was the music industry was gay dominated. Let's 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 put it right there in the spot. And you got a straight Puerto Rican thug kid trying to break it into the music industry, right? Um, and you're not in the crew, right? So you finally get into a crew, William Sokoloff, Mantronics, everybody's cool. And now you're back out in the street again. So you're starting over again from scratch. And this is where I have to give a big hug to a young, talented man by the name of Chep Nunez, um, who did a lot of edits. If you knew the Latin Rascals, you knew Chep Nunez because he was the next guy in line with the multi-edits. So I used to visit him. He used to edit at INS. 
And I used to visit them and sulk there like, man, I can't believe it. You know, I did a one record. You know, that's it for me. It's over. And he'd be like, no, nah, no. Nah. He would always be encouraging me, inspiring me. Uh, one day, there was a young gentleman arguing in the hallway that this guy took advantage of him. He paid for the session. He didn't show up to the session. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And Chep hears it. So he walks out and says, hey, what's going on? What's wrong? So this gentleman is, is telling him how he got taken advantage of and that he's working on a project and he got taken advantage of. And Chep just volunteered me. He said, this guy right here can help you. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, yeah. He says, he makes music. He has a hit record out and um, he can do it. So the guy looked at me. He says, you think you could do it? I was like, yeah. So he took my number. And he told me that he would give me a call. And he called me a few days later. And he said, I'm going to go give you a visit. I want to hear what you got. And I didn't have anything. Um, but at that time, I owned a Roland 707. So I started programming a beat. And I started writing the hook. And did a little bit of the verse. And he came and he came to give me a visit at my house. I lived, of course... Four guys were living in one room, two bunk beds. So he came to my home and I was kind of like, man, he's going to see where I live. He's going to be like, nah, I don't know. But he was cool. He came. His name is Jim McDermott. And uh, he walks in, he looks around and he says, show me what you got. So I hit the Rolling 707 and I start singing the hook and the drums are all arranged and he's bouncing around. He says, man, yeah, you know, I think we could do something with this. And that was the beginning of a label that we co-owned which had uh, It's Too Late by Tanya Wynn, Literally Love, Don't Take Your Love Away From Me, and Do It Properly, Two Puerto Ricans, A Black Man, and Dominican. My question is going to be this one. <laughs> How did Adonis feel about the Do It Properly boot with No Way Back? You know, he never called me back then. I just spoke to him maybe about two years ago for the very first time. He reached out to me on face, uh, Facebook. Facebook. And um, we spoke. Um, and I think that he, he, it was never a bad conversation. I think he wanted some information about do it properly and the master and all that. And I explained to him, man, that was like 35 years ago. You know, um, I don't even know where Jim McDermott is. Um, but he never really, I never really got anything negative from him directly. Who was back in the then, Back then, he never contacted us. Because, Who's the two Puerto Ricans, Dominican, and the black dude? Now, remember, <laughs> back then in Adonis, sampling was not illegal yet. Nobody was getting sued. Clear that. Clear that. And Claro, give us a clearing. Well, there was nothing being cleared yet. People were sampling people's records. If you remember, nobody was getting sued because no one had ever done it before. You know, hip hop was getting was jumping on it. This one was jumping up, but there was no lawsuits really following up. This was the beginning. Todd Terry was freaking sampling everything and everything. Right. So this is the beginning. No one was being sued yet at all. So maybe that's why Adonis didn't reach out at that time. You know what I'm saying? That's why I don't remember a phone or nothing being. Well, the I do remember the record that changed everything. One record. <laughs> Mars pump up the volume when he when CJ McIntosh sampled everybody's record yeah. and the lawsuits were lining up. That was much later on. Well, that's the one record where everybody came out of the woodwork and said, right. "Okay, enough." Yeah, that was that. I want to say that's a few years later too. That was but we're talking now, Jim later. McDermott days. Who? Okay, so you got Tanya Wynn. I remember very well. I worked with as well. Wonderful singer. Yeah, I met Tanya Wynn through Ken Taylor who was a keyboard player. And he was the very first one that I approached to be a partner in a production team. He was a bus driver, but he was from Brooklyn. And he used to go out with Tanya Wynn. So when Jim McDermott gave me the shot and said, okay, we're going to do a label together. This was the beginning of independent labels where, you know, there was money, record sales. So he was cool on taking a chance for me. So Ken says, I got my ex-girlfriend that sings. I said, great. I have this hook. It's too late for your love. Let's bring her in. Let's write it. Let's get this going. You know, that's the beginning of me saying, okay, now I'm not doing, I'm not working for uh, John Fair. Now I'm working for myself. This is the beginning of me opening up my own company. So we get together with Tanya. We write, it's too late for your love, put it out. And it does well. You know, it's, a, you know, I, I forgot what it charted, but it did very well. It did it well enough to do the remix. 
at the time that I'm working on the remix, I'm going to be a little off on time, but at the time that I'm working on the remix for Tanya Wynn, I meet Bruce Forrest at Better Days. Um, he is going to take off New Year's Eve. And he says, Rob, would you like to play at Better Days for New Year's Eve? And I said, absolutely. So that was the first club after uh, Studio 54 through school that I officially got to play in. And I loved his booth. He had three turntables. He had a trigger box on the floor. Um, he had he had the toys. And I will always thank Bruce for giving me that shot because that is the party that I meet David Colin. Um, he gives me New Year's Eve. Okay. So, so, okay. So let's talk about the, okay. So now you got a record label going on. Yep. You're, got now getting, around, you're getting around because you have records. It's like a business card. You have records that are making noise. Right. So it's not like you're, who are you? No, no. Oh, shit, that's your record? I can just hear everybody. Yo, that's you? You know how people were back then. Yo, yeah, hey, I, met, I, met, I met little Louie that way too because little Louie used to rent sound systems. So I met little Louie after making a couple of records and I remember him going, yo, man, I really like your work and all that. You know, and I'm renting the sound system for him to play in this big house party that we were doing three floors high. That's where I met little Louie around the same time. Um. I'm getting my years off. It's all right. Don't worry. But what about David Morales, too? When did you meet him? I met David Morales. I believe he was playing at Better Days Wednesday nights. I'm thinking that's what it is. But with the records that I'm putting out, I meet Judy Weinstein. Meeting Judy Weinstein, because if you were, I was an IDRC DJs with Eddie Rivera. But if you're starting to play in clubs and you're getting popular, everybody wants to be at For the Record. And why was that, Robert? Because I know why. Because why? all the superstar DJs were there. Like everybody who was anybody was there. So, you know, that was another step in the music industry as a DJ. But it, I can hear Eddie telling you, Robert, Conyo, how could you leave me now? But I, I, didn't leave. I never left. I never See, left. I want you to tell everybody. Did you leave Eddie Rivera or you no, stood there? I stood there all the way to his death. Um, oh, that's smart. But, but it became but, RPBC. Yes. RPBC. Yep. Absolutely. But... You got to meet Judy Weinstein. You know what I mean? It's like you meet Larry LeVan, you're DJing, you got to meet Judy Weinstein. So I met Judy Weinstein at that time. David Morales was her, I, I don't know if that's the right word, record boy? In the, I think he was, I think he took over David DePino, pool director, if I remember. Right, but what's the title? Because I don't want to say. Pool director. Record. Pool director. Pool director, okay. Yeah, because he used to put all the records and do all the sheets. Right, that's why that. I said record boy by mistake. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Record it, boy. It, 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 it doesn't sound right, so I don't want, you know, Morales to call me up and say, get it together. <laughs> but David um, Morales was the pool director. <laughs> yeah. So I met him there. And Judy knew the, the few records that I worked on. And she was like, well, you got to be as a, you got to be a resident. I remember telling her, you got to be a resident. And I was kind of like, I make records already. You know what I mean? There's a few people you have here that make records that aren't really DJing anywhere. But at the same time, I was, I'm a loyal guy, you know, Eddie was where I started and that's where I was staying. But that's where I met David for the first time. Then I knew he was playing a better days on, I think it was Wednesdays, maybe it's Tuesdays. It was a weekday. And um, and Bruce Forrest. I meet him the same day that I went to see David play. Bruce passed by, and I met him that day. And yeah, Bruce, I want to know, I want to know how the connection, you know, from of course we gotta get David called, but before that connection happens, how does David Morales and you go do do it properly? Well, that was late, that was later on. That was later on. Okay. Yeah, because don't forget, David was the one that uh, was already working with me, Cole. David Cole. That's right. Okay. So, so, David, so right, David, that's right. David Morales is a DJ. He's not working right. any records yet. And right. David Cole, uh, I meet in the New Year's Eve party that Bruce Forrest asked me to cover for him. He's going he's leaving for New Year's Eve and he tells me to cover his New Year's Eve party. And of course, who wouldn't want to play a better days on New well, Year's Eve? Well, that was the alter ego of the garage. It's like what? Yeah, yes. it, was, it was a circular dance floor and it sounded phenomenal. And that was Bruce Forrest's house. One of my favorite DJs, you know. Yo, if anybody did it right, yeah, I, gotta get, you know, I always say it, Bruce Forrest did it right. People ask me favorite DJs, and I always Bruce Forrest is always hey. in that ten for me. <laughs> Bruce Forrest is always in that top ten for me because he was, and I gave it when Larry was playing at the end of the garage. Bruce was pushing those new house records all the time. God bless him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and. 
by Bruce Forrest giving me that opportunity, I'm turning that night out. You know, I'm going in full throttle. That's New Year's Eve. I got to have everybody there screaming and stomping. And that's exactly what I did. I took those three turntables and just blasted it out. And a young man knocks on the door, redheaded black kid, <laughs> smiles, you know, with his million dollar smile, has, my name is David, what's up? I was like, what's up? My name is Rob. And he points to the little keyboard that I didn't even notice was there until he pointed to it. And he said, is it okay if I play on that? And I was like, sure. And he got up and he started rocking his thing. And I said, oh, wait a minute, I'm ready for this dude. You know, so I'm saying, I'm going to break this down. So I throw a cappella on, he starts playing the music and I just slam that bass line and then just drive everybody crazy. We play for the rest of the night. We had such a great time that we went to eat breakfast together. And that's where we started talking and where you from and da 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 and da da da. I told him how many brothers and sisters I have. I come from a big family. He says, I come from a big family too. And uh, we just clicked, you know, two poor dudes trying to get into the music industry. We had a great night. We just blended perfectly in the club live. And from that day on, we just hung out. I think that I hung out from that day till he passed away. Somebody asked me this question. What was the first record played by you the night at Better Days? Do you remember? No. I know it's silly, the first record. Okay, so let's ask it again. What was the first big record that you saw the crowd go, <sighs> Well, I mean, come on. You had, there was just too many. You know, you have absolutely no way back at that time. You have uh, uh, Steve Silk, Curly Jacket Body. You have, I mean, come on. There was just so many. And one thing about me, I did a journey like everyone else, but it was jam after jam after jam. Like the fillers, I left them home. You went in there to annihilate them because yes. you knew it was your night to, to tell everybody who you are. As a Absolutely. DJ, right? With no doubt. With no doubt. I went in it's there. It's not your home. You don't have time to play around and question. You got to go in there and bitch. I hate to talk like this. But you got to go in there and bitch slap them one after another after another. Right? It's New Year's Eve. And it's New Year's People ask me, what year was that? Mm. I don't remember. I don't. We got to go by the records we did, right? 86-ish? 87? Well, you got to go back to It's Too Late by Tanya Wynn. Whatever that year the label says is right within that time, right? Because I hire David Cole to do the keyboards to the remix of Tanya Wynn. So it's right in between that, that record. Where there was a promo or not. So within that year, you can tell when these things happen. So that's the year we did it. And we turned it out. Now, I, I turned out. You know, I turned out better days so bad that they were throwing $20 bills over the booth to me. You know what I mean? And that was the first time I ever had that happen to me. So I was like, what the heck is going on? But it amped me up to just kill them to the end. So no matter if I was playing a mid-tempo, up-tempo, a cappella, David playing the keyboards, it was just on to the end. Where... Bruce Forrest said, "Hey man, I heard you rock the night." <laughs> and that was another uh, that was another good memory that I remember because I remember Bruce playing, man. And if anybody's ever witnessed Bruce Forrest play, he's got a trigger box that samples, he's got his reel to reel, he's got his three turntables with his keyboard, and he'll play all of them. You know, and that was impressive to me. Around that time, how old were you? Around. Well, Come on see, I'm going to be terrible while I'm talking here. I'm going to be terrible with ages and years. But all I can tell you is, is I was born in 1964. <laughs> and if you go to Tanya Wynn's year, you know what I mean? Because that's, what I, was. that's what I what I would do. Yeah, sometimes I kind of like just add up and then, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's how old I was. <laughs> okay, everybody. You know he's in his mid-20s. We got it already. He's still, he's still young. <laughs> oh, my mid-20s was CNC Music Factory. Well, that's what I'm saying. You're still, you're, you're early, you know, you're still like just finishing college years and you're just coming up. Okay. Early yeah. 20s. That's yeah. about right. Yeah. That's a big thing. It's a big responsibility for a young guy, bro. No, nah, man, I was eating it up. I was ready to go. So I have a label, New York Groove Records, partnership with uh, Jim McDermott and David Drew, who was, who was my homeboy. He passed away. And um, while we're hanging out, David tells me, yeah, man, I play keyboards for Chef Pettibone and Arthur Baker. You want to come to a session? And that was my first visit to Shakedown. And I bump into Albert Cabrera because he, he's editing everything Arthur Baker's doing. And that's the first time I see him since high school. So I'm like, you edit? And he was like, yeah. I was like, 
oh snap, this this guy was in my class, you know, I remember him. And um I witnessed David Cole doing his first keyboard session there at Shakedown. Explain how important Shakedown was at that period, what was going on, because that was a very pivotal point. Yeah, you're talking movement. about Arthur Baker, you know, Africa Mambada, Planet Rock, and he was remixing anyone from Bruce Springsteen to whoever was there. It was between, the remixes were going between Arthur Baker and Shep Pettibone at that time. Those were the two top dudes that were getting everything at that moment. And David was playing keyboards for them. And David got that connection through Bruce Forrest, who was really close friends with Shep Pettibone at that time. Yeah, it's because people don't realize what was really going on back there. Because oh, it was, it, there'll never be a time like that again. You know, you're talking about studios open, Arthur Baker walking through, Shep Pettibone walking through, the Latin Rascals editing, Shep, Shep Pettibone editing, and you and they're remixing the top of the top genre of music there, the stars of the stars. You know, Debbie Harry's walking in, Bruce Spring, you know, that's a whole nother time. If I remember correctly, also, memory serves me right, Junior Vasco is around too, right? Yeah, Junior, my homeboy. He was another you know one. Saying? You forget, I, Junior was around there too, right? Oh boy, Junior was always a kind dude to me. You know, um, I'm always going to remember the good things because Junior, Larry, they were always great people with me. No, I know that. And they supported you guys. It supported Absolutely. you 100,000, oh. million, trillion, gazillion percent. I mean, they played your records to death. Yes, David DePino. David DePino. I tracked Paradise Garage. David tracks. De yep. David DePino was very essential to our career as well when, when we brought records in. There was, there was a bunch of Bill Coleman from Billboard magazine. You know, Bill helped me out with a few records. You know, a lot of people don't know. Where's me. Bill? Bring Bill up. God bless Bill. Peace Biscuit. Where is he? Bill Coleman has played me grooves and said, check this out. And I've written records with the grooves he's inspired me with. He said, hey, check this out. I'm like, I'm going to write a song over there. He's like, go ahead, do it. So Bill Coleman was also an awesome dude. There's so many, and I hope I don't forget anybody. No, we're we getting there. No we're, no, we're, no, we're covering a lot of people. We're covering a lot. <laughs> Damn, we're covering a lot of people. People that you I haven't even heard these names in a long, long time. And I'm like, well, the ones that are still around. Jim McDermott's name I haven't heard forever. Jim wow. McDermott, yeah, he became a VP in BMG, I think. I spoke to him like two years ago for the first time in a long time. Um, but he became a real big executive in the music industry. So going back to the Arthur Baker scenario, I'm sitting there and I'm watching David play keyboards. Um, of course, I'm a, I'm a producer already, so I'm on the independent side not really remixing anybody's records aside from the Dar Braxton record. And I tell David, hey, you want to do a keyboard session? And he was like, yeah, bet. You know, um, and we go in to do our first session and I did it at INS because, you know, you do your first remix that you kind of want to go to the studio where you got used to for the first time. And uh, David comes in and we're doing a remix for It's Too Late, Tanya Wynn. And um, David plays this keyboard line and I'm listening to it. And he goes, what do you think? And I was like, mm. and he laughs. And I'm like, why are you laughing? He says, because you're the first person that's going, mm. and I go, well, you know, try this. And I'm, and I give it to him, da, 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 da. you know, he's like, and he looks at me and he smiles and he plays it. But then he goes, that's pretty dope. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm the first person that does that to you. He says, well, you know, when I go into an Arthur Baker session or Chef Pettibone session, they usually take a break. And I play the tape and I just do keyboards and play whatever I want. And then they take the pieces that they want to use. They arrange them and put them together. I said, oh, so they spoiled you. <laughs> and he starts laughing. I said, well, I don't like pieces and I don't like to cut. I want to do exactly the parts that I want to do. I want to put them exactly where they go and we're done. And he was like, okay, cool. So that was the first time that David Cole looked at me and separated me from everybody else he was working with. Because he was like, this guy is singing his parts. He knows what he wants. And he ain't leaving the room. He's staying here to pick the sound with me, to EQ it, and to make sure that every little fill is just right. Is that a sign of OCD and control? Not negatively speaking. Yeah, words, I have, you know, I, I, I you have OCD. Be really controlling it. I have OCD. I've always had it. Thank you so much. We need to, that's what I'm saying. Cause I've heard others that talk I about have extreme OCD, not just OCD. Like to the, to the other side of OCD. OCD where I will not stop until it's right. 
But when you were a kid, they wouldn't even know to diagnose it back then because that didn't exist like that. Well, you know, my mother was busy working. Don't forget, my mother was busy working. And maybe my mother had OCD. You know, maybe I picked it up. You know what I'm saying? It's like we become who we surround ourselves around. Because you know? I'm hearing detail. And I and I know oh, in your detail is extreme with me. Detail has always been extreme from the time I told you that I listened to the radio and I wasn't just listening to the song. I was listening to the bass part. I was listening to strings. I was listening to the 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 reverb that I didn't know was called reverb, <laughs> air. You know, back then you say air. So I listen to all those things, you know, and I feel them. You know, it's not just listening to them, but it's almost like you. I mean, I don't know how to explain it, but you kind of live the arrangement, you know. So when I'm hearing music, I'm inside it. I know that might sound strange, but it's almost like being inside the headphones, right? You know, you put your headphones, you close your eyes, you can really immerse yourself into the song. So I'm one of those people that immerse myself into anything that I'm doing. That's why I told you if I hire a lawyer, he's got to teach me how to be a lawyer. So you when know? you hire an engineer, he's you got, got to teach, teach me. How to be Absolutely. Teach you Absolutely. How to be an engineer. That was the number one thing that I did from the beginning. We're working with any engineer is just teach me what you're doing. So I have a funny quick anecdote to this. In this that I remember one of our mutual friends that worked for, um, for, for CNC, for Robert, said to me, Robert would come in two o'clock in the morning after I mixed and take all the faders and go and start to bring the faders back up. <laughs> and then he would leave the studio for two hours and Robert would come back and hear the mix. Yeah. And then he clicked the recall and started to put the mix back and took some of Robbie's stuff and then have to kind of finesse it. That was the beginning. But I've done that to every single engineer. I know you have. I heard it from every engineer I work with. Rosa, I've done it to Aja Key. I've done it to every single person. Because when I first came into the music industry, the norm was let the engineer bring the mix up, right? He's going to bring it up, and he's going to try to make sense of it. And to me, that never made sense, right? That's my OCD. That doesn't make sense. You got to hear it the way I hear it. But you're the new guy. So you want to flow with everybody. And flowing is that the engineer have his time. But when I would come in, it would sound like a train wreck to me. You know what I mean? Because it's not what I want. It's like asking somebody to draw your picture for you. You're the artist and you're saying, figure out what I want to draw. <laughs> and when I come back, I hope you read my mind. And then you come back and you're like, that's impossible. He doesn't know what I want. He doesn't know. He doesn't go to the garage. He doesn't know how a kick should sound. He doesn't, he should know. He doesn't know how the bass should respond. He doesn't know how those mid range should be through those bullets perfect and those high mids. He doesn't know that. He's here in the room. You know what I mean? So I'm coming from all these experiences of being a DJ and being in these clubs and listening to Sonic. And he's in this room, you know, trying to make sense of a record, you know? So. So did that have actually put you in situations that you're arguing with with your guys? No, because then back then back then nobody wanted to argue with me. I was one of those thug boys. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying would you have a machete with you? What were we gonna do? Uh, I was just I mean, I come from the street, man. I used to mug people when I was young and all that stuff. You know, I'm coming from Harlem, but not saying that that was anything, it was just my serious persona. Yeah, you always had that same look, like you want to kill somebody. Yeah, I mean, blame my mother. Don't no, but that's the truth because I remember you ever seen you, you always blame like my that. mom's because you know what? That was the serious look she's given since I've been a kid. So I learned it. So that's why people would say, You all right? And I'd be like, Yeah, I'm good. So I would break out of it. They, He's but, happy right now. Right. But no one would dare, you know, walk up to me. So the person that would walk up to me, they would figure out, wow, this is just his thing. He's not, he's really not a bad guy. He's just got this look. So that helped me in the studio. No one would really argue with me, but yeah, I would come in, flatten everything out, volumes down. We're going to start from the kick up. And I remember the first engineer saying, that's not the way you do it. And I gave him a look and I said, that's the way we're going to do it. You know, we're going to EQ this kick. What engineer was that, my friend? Um, I don't think it was Jim Lyons. I think Jim Mazai was second. I think there was Steve Griffin. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember Steve Griffin. It was one of them. But they were cool with it. You know, they looked at me, they saw a series. It's very cool. Bonsai is super cool. Right? Bonsai never gave me a problem. When I put He's the faders, with the flow. When I, when I put the faders down, he was like, all right, let's just start again. Yeah, I mean, let's start again. I'm getting paid. You know what I mean? I, we'll be here forever if you want. But my technique was you got to get your drums and bass perfect. And from an engineer standpoint, they put everything up. They, put, they start balancing everything, and then they start putting reverbs on things that they need. And then they put this, and they try to chisel it all together. But me, it's kind of like, if you have to do 
Wait, everyone. We're getting a technical little green goblin. Hold on. We missed the, the part you said. They chisel everything and then you fell yeah. out. Yeah, the engineers will put everything up, you know, balance, drums, bass, and then they start EQing and bringing everything, making the right. And to me, that was just a mess. I needed the foundation to be solid. You know, if we're doing a dance record, that bass and those drums got to be on the money. Uh, you know, these are garage ears. You know what I mean? These are, you know, my ears are going to a place where this has got to sound right. And then my mid-range and my keyboards and all that, that came from Quincy Jones listening to his live jazz records and listening to those Sonics. So I needed to fuse that. You know, I grew up with WABC, 99X, and VLS, and that is my musical education, that variety and the fusion of genius together. It's not one or the other. So that's the way it was for me. So I was always adamant that we had to work on the drums and bass. And that was Jim Bonsai Lions, Bruce Miller, Bob Rosa, you name any engineer that David Sussman, any engineer that came in, it was like, I'm not doing it your way, you know, because it worked for me, right? From the first record that I did, moving forward and learning sonics for them, it just worked for me. And and I'm one of those guys, I'm sorry that I have that OCD and it's just gotta be my way. Whoa. So when nice. you hear so when you hear the CNC sound, you're hearing Rob's perspective and sound, you're not hearing an engineer's perspective of sound. They're co-collaborating with me, right? We're getting it up the way I want. And then they're going, well, let's try this. And then I go, yeah, that's dope. But then let's do this, you know? But that first, that bottom and that drums and those percussion, you're hearing Robert. You're not hearing an engineer do what they want. Okay, everybody, let's go into Silent Morning, Noel, because we got to touch that. And also imagination instinctual where arthur baker is involved and lee john and before, and that, before that is do it properly well you know what i'm saying even do it pro i'm trying to get the timing right do it properly right so so, so, so it all down those records gotta be all broken down step let by step you, let me lead you into remix of tanya win then we go to lydia lee love which is a freestyle record little louis is now playing in heartthrobs and I want him to play my record. So we write this song by Literally Love called Don't Take Your Love Away. But at the same time, while I'm trying to write a record for Louis to play, I got to have something for the club people to play. So that's the first time that I say, yo, Dave, let's do a house mix on one side and a freestyle record on the other side. And the Dave that I'm talking about is David Cole because he did the keyboard session. So now he's, I got him. While he's working with everyone else. He's working with me. We're not partners yet, but he's coming in and, and, and doing keyboards for me as well. And that's the first record that has a house record on one side or a house version on one side and a Latin freestyle version on the other side. And that Let's came clarify that first record, everyone. First release commercially where you have house mix on one side. And Latin freestyle record on the other side other. to fulfill the DJs that are now my friends to play the record. So I came by just trying to get it played on both sides, and then it becomes the standard that everybody's doing. <clears throat> then, by that time, I witnessed Bruce Forrest live with No Way Back playing records and triggering a sample over it. Um, I'm doing my own version of it. It's something that every DJ has been doing forever, doing medleys and reel-to-reels or putting records together, but Bruce Forrest triggers the influence because he's doing it live. So now everyone that's playing in Better Days, he starts letting me play in Better Days as well. I follow him. That's, that's dope. What this dude is doing is dope. He's taking what we do at home and we're editing and we're going back and fixing and he's doing it live. You either fail or you succeed. And that to me was intriguing, you know? Um, did it say this, bro? Can I say this? Like, they nicknamed him the MacGyver of the night clubs. Remember? Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, the idea doesn't immediately come. It just really is all about working on records. And one day, I tell David Cole, yo, let's make that medley that happens in, in better days, you know, with No Way Back and all that. He was like, yeah, why not? It's, it's just one of those days. It wasn't even meant to be put out as a record. It was just, let's have some fun. And then by that time, Dave Morales is like, yo, Rob, man, you know, if there's anything I can never do, but that's in my head. You know, it wasn't immediate, but during our relationship that I'm in better days, I see that he wants to do something. And, you know, 
And one of the things that I've always wanted to do and I've always done is help people, right? If it took me this long to make it into the music industry, I didn't really want it to be difficult for anyone else. So I tell David Cole, I'm not going to do it in my house. I'm going to ask David Morales if I could do it for the record. But David Cole is just, but why? You know? And I was like, well, I'll ask him to do some mixes with me. He says, but why? You could do it. I was like, I just want to help out. So he was like, if that's what you want to do, go for it. So I called Dave. I said, Dave, can we go for the record? Use the reel to reel. Do a couple of mixes. I'm going to do this No Way Back medley and just put it out, you know, just to play. And that's how we end up in For the Record. I do a few mixes over the thing. We're doing pieces. And then I ask him to uh, do his mixes. I take those mixes. I go to Chep Nunez, right? He's helping me out. So he's in the crew. And then I sit there and I put the pieces together with him. He says, let me do a multi edit. I was like, this is not that type of record. He said, let me do just one. So there's kind of one in there in the record. And I was like, that's it, study. This is a house joint. You know, I don't want too many. Bam, 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 bam. Nah, we're not into that. So I let him do one. And then I take it to INS. And then David comes with the keyboards and we start overdubbing it. And we put it together, put a white label out. And the white label just explodes. It just it was just to give the DJ something to play, but it just goes ben, absolutely one, insane. One question in my mind. David Cole's playing what keyboard on that record? Do you remember? Well. That organ sound? It's his favorite. Well, it, it's his favorite one. I don't know if it's the, I don't think it's the CZ 101. I'm trying to remember. There was one little keyboard that he always used in the beginning because he was on a budget and he only had one keyboard. Come on. <laughs> I don't really remember the name of it. Bruce Forrest will tell you. You know, he's gonna have to he's gonna have to give that one up because yeah. you know, where's Bruce Forrest? Go knock on Bruce's door so I get the name. <laughs> <laughs> but he always had this keyboard. He took it all around all around with him. And he used to really edit his sounds to make them his. I wonder if it was a D50. Could be. Could I think be. It was a D50, if I remember he was Could playing. Be. All right, so because it had that famous organ sound that you guys you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna join you and say most likely that. I cool. think it's a D50. Wasn't that big, small, it was easy yeah. to edit, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm All right. Go, go ahead. I'm Keep gonna going. Flow with that one. So he's doing the keyboards. We put the record together. I have my label. So we make what's called a bootleg, right? Um, back in the day, people were doing bootlegs. They were just putting out records with white label with a with a with a title and just put it out. Um. How does a name two Puerto Ricans a black man Dominican come and do it properly? Because a lot of people ask that. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't that we formed the group. Because I went and mixed with David the mixes. Then I went by myself to Chep and edited the pieces. Well, Chep, I, is, Chep is the Dominican guy. Yeah. Because yeah. I know you're Puerto Rican and Morales is Puerto Rican. I'm, yeah, but I'm not even thinking of that. I'm just bang, bang, go to INS, bang. I'm sitting in my record label in Queens and David Drew, who is uh, a co-owner with uh, Jim McDermott of our label, New York Groove. He was this English guy. And he always said, eh, little queen, you know, little queen. He used to be like, Robert, if you're going to do something, always do it properly. So I remember always remembering him say that and I'm snapping, you know, snapping on him. But then he's the one that writes the label copy. So he's like, Rob, we need a title. Right? It's a bootleg. There's no name. So he goes, Rob, we need a title. So I look at him with a smirk and I said, do it properly. He says, don't be sarcastic. I was like, no. It's a medley. Do it properly. He's like, okay. He writes it down. And he says, you don't have a group name. So I'm sitting there and I go through one group uh, uh, and then it comes to me. David, me, two Puerto Ricans, Chips of Dominican. Two Puerto Ricans, a black man, Dominican. And I, read, I remember him looking at me because no one's really ever called a, a title. That's the first time someone puts cultures in a group name. And he goes, that's a little, I don't know. I was like, no, 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 do it. He said, I think it's brilliant, but it's daring. I was like, two Puerto Ricans, a black man, Dominican. And, and remember, everyone, this is the 80s. Things were very quiet still. People being gay, coming out of the closet, still not accepted the same way as it is now. Right. Ethnicity was kept very, people remember this, like you sent out a resume in those days. 
he tried to make it whiteify to get a job. You know, if you if you were Latino, I my my friends told me I had to take my name Carlos to call. I mean, things like that. Yeah, people you make know, it's it crazy. crazy. Yeah, and he was kind of like, "You sure?" He says, "I think it's brilliant, Rob." But are you sure? I was like, "Absolutely, it's cool." And um, the bullet goes out and just blows up. How many copies do you guys remember selling like on that day? Come on, man. Those man. days you you move you move units, bro. Hundreds of thousands of units. You know, you know, it may have pushed four hundred and fifty thousand singles. You know, back in the day, and then got, and then I don't know if a bootleg's ever been signed before, but this one got signed to Pete Tong. What label was it? I forgot the label, but I think it was like a major London. What, what did he? Yeah, work London on? Records. So, Simon put, Harris is here on here. He'll know. Simon, <laughs> tell him which label. <laughs> no, that that's the thing. That's a bootleg. You were talking about getting sued for samples or nothing. We didn't get sued, and they put it on a major label in Europe. So that record became so big. Okay, so were you even thinking about lawsuits and, and and no, right? No, nobody was. Nobody was. Because the record was so big that I told David uh Cole, because I keep, you know, I don't want anybody to get confused. I said that we gotta write a song. Like we could turn this into a real record. That's how big this is blowing up. And he was like, yo, bet. So we go in to INS again, and now we recreate. Boom, 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 boom. And we start sampling the records we put on the record, putting it together. And then I called Tanya Wynn up because we did it too late. And I was like, Tanya, we got a chorus for you. Come on, come sing it. And we write it right on the spot. There's so many ways to do it. <laughs> and we write a real record. And that process, Judy Weinstein calls me up and says, why don't you have David Morales working on this record with you? And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, he worked on the first one with you. I said, no. I said, I put him on to do the record with me. You know what I mean? And it was a bootleg. But now I'm making a real record for my company. And this is something that we I started with David Cole. And we're going to just finish the record. And she just was like, you can't do that. Da -da 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 and while she was talking, I was kind of like, you know what? I wanted to help him before. Let me help him again. David Cole was kind of like, yo, this is our record. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but, you know, it makes sense to let him do one. So I, what I did was I said, Judy, I'm going to let him do additional remix and put it on the B side. Is that okay? And that was cool. You know, he came to INS. I remember Dave came looking at the multi-track. You know, I think he went to the studio to visit it with Bruce Forrest before that, but he still didn't really know the board yet. So I sat there, told him, you know, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. He was like, yeah, 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 I got it. And he did, that was his, I believe that was his first remix that he got to do. And it was cool. It made sense. Two Puerto Ricans and Batman Dominican, regardless of who started the record, I had him uh, involved and it wouldn't have made sense for not to keep him involved for the commercial release. So we kept it um, and it, anything to help anybody out. So for those of you who know, Judy Weinstein would be pushing that. She was Larry LeVan's pseudo manager too doing his remixes and doing a lot of stuff during from the disco era so she was trying to always get her people she was doing a job she was doing her job and, and she's doing what she does and, and, and you know what if I, would have been in those shoes, if I would have been in those shoes i would have been doing it too like come on man this is my moment <laughs> so um, that cracks david morales's cherry there it's like it's, yeah. his, it's his it's his it's his baptism basically in the, in the music industry absolutely remember that dave <laughs> and then um oh we were all so jealous you could be sure we were also jealous we were like damn <laughs> but the record blew up and did real well around yeah, four hundred thousand units is doing real well more because that was the bootleg now came the original that gets added to bls correct so you're talking about another and gets on another label in the rest of the world so who knows how many records sold, right? Because some were sold behind the truck and some were sold in the store. That Those were the days that people were just pressing up and doing whatever they wanted. Uh, but I was excited, right? Because we had Tanya, which was a pretty big club record. We had Lydia Love that became an iconic freestyle record. Not the club record, but the freestyle song till this day plays. And now we have this crossover song, Do It Proper, that goes, you know, it's you can basically say it's pop. 
you know, with the sales that it was doing. Um, yeah, notice how major companies take the word, the bastard word, dance out. They call it pop now. But we all know it was a dance how a house dance record, right? Absolutely. Yeah. They would never say that up there. They'll be like, oh no, that's a pop record. Okay. <laughs> they forget to mention the most important part is where it came from. Club C. So David and David Cole and I are not partners yet. He's just strictly working for me and do it properly is the first record that we co-produce, right? He came from Lydia Lee, uh Tanya Wen doing keyboards. Lydia loved doing keyboards as well. And then now do it properly. Went from a bootleg to our first record that we produced together as Clavellis and Cole without being Clavellis and Cole yet. Because not everyone knows, but David wanted to be an artist. He wanted to be a recording artist. And around that time, he had a record that Bruce played for years called You Take My Breath Away. And they were trying to shop that record, but it wasn't being signed. It would later on get signed with us but it wasn't getting signed, but he really truly wanted to be a recording artist at that time. So when I told him, Hey, let's get together after do it probably was like, let's, let's become an item, you know, let's be, let's be partners. Let's go for it. This is doing great. Let's move on. And he was kind of like, well, you know, I got this recording thing that I want to do. And, you know, I want to be an what artist. Capacity was he saying recording artist, just keyboard singer, singer. He, sang. he had a song called you take my breath away that he sung on it. And he, that was a big, hit and better days at that time just better days um but he wanted to become a record and bruce forrest uh, was trying to help him get signed i believe that's what david cole told me that uh bruce was trying to get assigned so you know he just stayed playing keyboards working with arthur working with shep working with this it wasn't until a very famous record came out that that day Colin Clavillis was born out of it. It was a negative experience that David had. And uh, that was the day that I said, hey, I remember telling him, hey, I don't want to bust in and get in the middle of your keyboard life, but we're writing records now and producing records. So give this a year. And if you give it a year, I promise that we will be at the top of this situation. And that record, because he was disappointed in it, he said, yeah, all right. <laughs> and that was a little while after Do It Properly. And it was by Janet Jackson. <laughs> you gave me that look like you're going to ask me. <laughs> no, I don't want to ask because I'm thinking about Pink Cadillac 2. I remember Larry LeVan playing that on, at, at studio. Well, that was, it, that, was it, that was later on. Right. I'm thinking about what records was like the ones that really in the commercial side start to really. Become well, well, he didn't do a record for me. It was a song that he did keyboards on. And he was supposed to get a credit. Which that, record was that? Do you remember? Ask that. I don't want to get into problems, but I'm going to do it for factual situations. Please do. OK. Janet, Janet Jackson comes out with When I Think of You. Big record. Everybody becomes a Janet Jackson fan. Shep, don't kill me, but I got to say it. Lenny asked. David is about to do keyboards on Pleasure Principle. Super excited. Yo, I'm going to work on Pleasure Principle. And I was like, wow, you, you can't get That's any huge. Bigger. That's huge. You can't huge. get any bigger. You know, I'm. Jam and Lewis production, Jam. Huge. Right, 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 right. He said, you know, I'm going to do this. And Shep is going to give me additional production and keyboards. I'm going to go kill it. So I was like, yo, that is an awesome opportunity. He does it. He's excited. We're walking in the village. It's release day. We walk into the record shop. He looks at the record and his face falls and he cries. That's the first time that I saw David Cole, a tear come down of his eyes. He didn't get credit. He didn't get the additional production, but on top of that, he didn't get keyboard credit either. And that's what stung. I don't know if that's the label's fault. I don't know whose fault that is, but I know that that hurt him so bad. And I got pissed off for him being his boy there looking at it. That that's when I looked at him and said, listen, you're selling yourself short being a keyboard player. We've produced the record already. You know that I'm where I'm going with this. You need to come with me and we need to become a duo. And I guarantee you that in a year, 
who are going to be up here. And that was the record that triggered it. So even though it was a bad experience, I got to thank Shep Pettibone because Shep Pettibone, <laughs> whatever happened there, whether it was the label of Shep Pettibone, you helped Clavillis Co. become fulfilled. First heard on True House Stories, everyone. <laughs> right there. Thank you, Shep Pettibone, for that little either error from the record label or, <laughs> or you know what? I have Nowhere in the press. <laughs> Let's put it like this. You know how record labels are. They were the worst with credits. Come on, bro. You remember yeah. that. Yeah. You but you know what? That. It's the one credit that I'm glad that happened because look at what happened after that. Yeah. Who? It, that, this. Okay. So because of the tear coming from his eye and the despair and anger, was like, yeah, we could do this. Yeah, I told him, I said, listen, you don't have to be looking at labels for, for keyboard credit anymore. How about produced? How about co-produced? How about remix? How oh, about, like, come Robbie, on. Robbie, how much in those days were keyboard players charging for sessions back then? I don't know how much he got. Now, just that him. What was the going number? like? I mean, keyboard? when I was paying him, I was independent. So I was taking the money out of my pocket. So I'm sure he wasn't charging that to, to people. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, because sure. you couldn't afford it. You didn't have the budgets back then. Right? I'm sure they were taking care of him, but you know, he was getting paid 500 or more a session, you know. Um, the remixer would get the, 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 the bulk of the money. And that's another thing. Economically, I told him, I said, why are you getting paid this amount of money when well, we could get paid this amount of money for doing the same thing and getting the credit for it? So out of that one record and that one disappointment, he was like, bet. And he went from making a keyboard session to half of a remixes uh, a fee, which was way better, right? A brand new remix at those times would get twenty five hundred a remix. That beats five hundred dollars a keyboard session, and you get to do what you want, and your name goes on. <laughs> so it wasn't a bad sell. <laughs> no, because as long as you're on the inside and you were wanted, it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, trying to break through and getting into that league of champions because there's only a few guys doing it is not an easy feat yeah yeah so i pushed him and i pushed him but i didn't push him enough because i knew of his dreams but i pushed it at the right moment you know throughout the year you're telling me hey we could do this we could do that but he has his own thing so he's telling me no 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 and finally he said yeah and and the rest was history okay so what's the fight back where did we begin right after that whole thing that happened with i think it's pink cadillac we meet Carol Cooper. I meet Carol Cooper. I forgot where I met her. I don't know if I met her in Eddie's record pool. I'm working on my own songs and don't have a manager. And Carol Cooper comes into the picture. And Carol Cooper is the one that got us the Natalie Cole remix. Um, she went to Jerry Griffith at that time. I believe he was heading the urban department and they had a, a song. It was a remake of Bruce Springsteen's Paint Cadillac that Natalie had done. It was live. And I remember we got the record, INS again. <laughs> We're still in INS. We haven't graduated to the other ones yet. And the record is in a key that's impossible to do a house record. And I believe it was major. And most house records were in minor. And Robert Clavillis tells David, I don't give a crap about keys right now. It's got to feel good. It's Natalie Cole, and we got to make this rock. And David said, he just laughed. He always smiled when he thought a, a, there was a good idea that didn't make sense, but it was a good idea. And uh, that's when we came out with boom, 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 boom. And yeah, it's two different keys, but it feels good. And you're not using any of the original parts from the multi-track either. That's the first time. Exactly. Thank you. I want that clarified. Yeah, I, keep, I, I keep about, I keep, I keep thinking about the first times of things, right? Because Chef Pettimone and them added to product productions, right? Francois Kavokin added to productions, but no one said this record is terrible. And right. in the Robert Clavillis manner, <laughs> all the faders, <laughs> Leave Vo the only just leave the vocal up. She's singing, and we go, That sounds a lot better. <laughs> and that's when we have the key problem. And I was like, The heck with it. So, this that's the first record, I believe. I don't think anyone can challenge it. 
that someone takes the complete production away from the song and only uses the vocal and writes a complete new production, not remix, a complete new production were titled remixes because that's the way they kept them no matter what you did. But we did everything from scratch. And we give it to the label and Natalie hates it. Jerry Griffith hates it and is not going to put it out. So we got hired, rocked it, and fired all at the same time. And we're all going home tripping. Like, this is our first major label remix. I and promised we, David that we were going to be rocking. And we blew it! And we got fired. <laughs> I'm going to give a big up to Carol Cooper. We're walking home. She says, hey, I'm going to talk to Jerry Griffin. And even though he doesn't want to release it, I'm going to ask him to just put a white label out for clubs only. She calls him up. He says, she hates the record. I hate the record. Da -da, de -de -de -do, da -da -da -da. I mean, it was just crazy. Carol says, Jerry, just put it to the record pools. You don't have to release it. You don't have just the record pools. He finally says, yes. I get the promo. David gets the promo. We go to tracks on a Tuesday. David DePino's killing it. We give him the dub. And the moment that he plays it, everybody starts running up and saying, what's that record? 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 So we knew we did our job. So we didn't have to go back to Jerry Griffin because the record pools went back. And that's the beauty about back in the day when record pools and DJs got serious and got behind a record. The That's the power all, of the DJ. All the power you needed. And they were forced to put the record out as a club single. What happened? So they put the live version on radio and it's not working. The one that she did is not working. Pop is going, eh, eh, eh. So we cut a seven inch. We do an edit of the seven inch of the club record. Radio starts playing it. It becomes a top three pop record and all the United States. <laughs> so is we got fired, and because of Carol doing the pro, the promo, rehired, leading to the DJs, leading to the seven inch, number three pop, top one hundred, smashing the radio, and now Natalie Cole loves us. <laughs> Ain't that something that you yeah. got to go through all that to prove a point? Yeah, and that was the beginning of our remix career. So from the independent label, we now start remixing records, but I've always wanted to produce and write. That was my thing, you know, but we knew that the remixing could take us there if we met the right people. So we started remixing and I meet Bruce Carbone that becomes a great friend of mine. And he says, I got to introduce you to my boss, Larry Asgar. And anybody that's met Larry Asgar, that's Danny Aiello, the actor and real life person in the record industry. You know, if you know the actor, Danny Aiello. <laughs> and um, Bruce talks us up. Larry looks at me. He says, you think you could do it? I was like, well, I've done it a few times already. You know, okay. All right. He gives us a remix. Uh, I forgot the name of the record. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the record. But to make a long story short, not long after that, he moves to his own label. He goes to AM and opens up Vendetta Records. And uh, Bruce comes along, so the whole crew's together. And Larry gives me the gift that I've always wanted. He said, I'm moving to another label. I need a smash. Do whatever you want. Those are the words that someone always wants to hear. Do whatever you want. <laughs> At that time, Bill Coleman. Is rock and billboard magazine mad cool friends with us loves what we're doing champions us he plays me this groove he says yo rob check out this groove is is bumping in london he plays me an instrumental and i'm like damn that's pretty dope he's, he's, give me this. do you hear that noise yeah i don't know if i'm gonna have to move somewhere else what are they doing construction yeah they're doing something outside here that's all right all Thank right you. i'll talk loud so um Oh, yeah. Tell him no traba trabajando. Oh, yeah. 
Nah, don't worry about it. We're going to keep it ghetto. Let's keep it real. So where was I? So Larry gives you the endless checkbook. And oh, he gives you the endless checkbook. It says, I need something. We need a smash. It's going to be my first release. Bill Coleman gives me a groove. He says, yo, this is popping in London. Check it out. And let me skip in there. I think a year before, we do a project called The Cover Girls, and we come out with a record called Because of You. I don't know about publishing and writers yet. Uh, Sal Abatilla calls me, says, we need a record. We write because of you. Sal says, I'm only going to give you the record. I got to go back because that's that leads me to that. Um, I need a record. I called David. I said, we need a record. It's an album. He says, I got one. He plays me the demo because of you. Bat. Uh, I reproduced the track with him because it was a demo. He wrote the record in like an hour. Um, Sal says, there's only one thing that comes with it. You got to make Little Louis co-producer. I'm like, but the record is done. He says, you got to do it. Um, Why? Because Andy Panda, Tony Moran, Sal Abatillo, Little Louis. I go to Little Louis's first recording studio because Eddie says, I want him to go to the first recording studio, but I want to help him. So I want you to come along. I forgot, I skipped that. So we go, it's Gail King, Little Louis. Joey Gardner's already helping little Louie by having him in the studio. I take him there to the studio. Wow, there's a bunch of stories I'm missing here, but let me try to get it together. Um, I don't know if little Louie did Silent Morning yet. Maybe it was after Because of You, because this is all happening within the time. It's That's all right, everybody, I, we don't care. We're working on Because of You, and Salah Batilla says, we want to help Louie. The record is all, almost done. So you got to bring him in. So I now got to talk to David Cole and say, hey, we got to do this to get this done. And he's like, and, and David was always, when I came with David Morales, he was like, why? And now he's doing it again. Why? I'm going to say, well, say again. Why? I to, and I used to always talk to David Cole and I used to always tell him, listen, if we're helping somebody along the way, it's not going to take away from what we're doing. If that's what we got to do, that's what we got to do. The cool thing about it is that even though the record was done, we brought little Louis to the studio and we made sure that he had his input. It was, It's better that way than just putting his name on it. You got me? And we brought little Louis in, made him feel comfortable. I had already taken him to his first studio with Eddie. Um, Jelly Bean was kind of, he. they were trying to get Jelly Bean to help him. Um, and it was just the right thing to do, really. It was just... That's hope, you know. I Like I said, I'm always going to say it. I remember deeply how hard it was for me to make it. So if I can make it easier for someone, as long as they had talent, cool. So Because of You comes out, becomes a big pop record. It becomes the cover girls, even bigger than Show Me, believe it or not. I don't know why, but it was the follow-up to Show Me, and it was huge. So someone in the studio says later on, man, those publishing checks must be big. Never heard the word publishing, ever. So I'm like, what do you talk about publishing? He was like, he looks at me and goes, oh, ask David. <laughs> so I go to David Cole, and David Cole at that time, he's kind of like, let's not do two remixes a week. You know, let's just do one. And I'm kind of like, what are you talking about, man? I need to make money. That goes in my head. And I go, by the way, someone asked me, you must be doing good with publishing checks. What is that? And anybody that knows David Cole, he has a famous chuckle. You know, that little, ah! Yeah, I remember that. And he did that. He did that, but never explained it to me. You know? Someone else explained it to me. He says, yo, when it goes on radio, when it sells, you get this check from ASCAP or BMI, and bro, this could be like that, 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 that. And I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm like, what the heck? So I say, yo, Dave. How come I didn't get any publishing? I worked on the music with you. Yeah, but the demo was done. I was like, yeah, but the demo wasn't the record. He was like, well, you got to write. So, like I told you, my mother taught me not to get mad. You just go for it. But no, in your mind, you're saying, what do you mean I got to write? Because you're right. already writing. You're right. already thinking right. in your mind, 
your writing. Right. But then he he was teaching me that if a demo is done with music and lyrics, it's already the record. Even if you change the track. But I expected more from him because we're working together. He's like, bro, you know the real deal here. You know what I mean? But he was kind of like, it is what it is, Rob. I was like, oh, okay. So we're working. Fast forward to Larry saying, do what you want. <laughs> so I come back. And I talk to David and I tell Larry, I want to create a girls group. I want a white girl, an Asian girl, a black girl, and a Puerto Rican girl. That's my vision. And everybody said, that's a great idea. So I remembered the cover girls. And now we have an album project with Larry. And I said, I am going to write. <laughs> and I remember going to my house. I put the groove that Bill Coleman gave me, played it. Sat down with the pad and I said, I'm not getting up until I got the song written. And I ended up writing this song called You're My One and Only True Love by Seduction that went top 40 pop. Um, wrote half the album. We had four top 10 records on Vendetta Records with that, with that group. And it did awesome. You know, that led to getting a publishing deal with David Steele. I'm afraid to ask, in those days, the advances were humongous for publishing deals. The advance actually got me nervous, right? Because I'm doing two remixes a week. Um, so I'm making a hundred K a year, right? Splitting 50-50 with uh with, with David. I write these songs, learned about writing and, and publishing. And now I got the songs on radio, so I'm getting these crazy checks in the mail. I'm going, now I know why David chuckled. <laughs> and then comes David Steele comes, and he offers me and David a seven-figure deal. So that got me nervous, right? Because you have this dream of making it. You're broke most of your life. You're making a hundred the richest guy in the world, like two remixes a week, seven days a week, just banging it out. Then you're in the clubs at night. You know, I was living that life of the 90s. Clubs, movies in between the sessions, hitting the sessions, keyboard, drums, you know, just moving around. And now we do this production and this guy's offering me, you know, a million dollars, right? Seven figures, right? It's kind of like, what the heck? <laughs> so I'm like, I'm making it, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it gets you nervous, right? Because it's like, can I continue? Now comes the the money blocks you for a minute saying, am I going to, they're going to give me money. Am I going to be able to pay this back? You know what I mean? Is this like going to work out? You know, it's, it's all new. But David Steele, championed it he said you guys i've been watching your career since the beginning he was working for virgin music at that time and he says i know you guys can do it so we cut this big deal we're remixing records um uh start writing now we're with larry so the remixing stops and now we're producing but still doing some remixes because so they're paying us a lot of money so Seduction is big. Larry doesn't like the sales that's going on in Seduction. He puts out a few other singles on there. Um, I think This Is Acid was on Vendetta Records. I'm trying to remember a few other records. And then Tommy Matola calls Larry Asgar at the same time that I'm remixing and says, Larry, why don't you come to Sony? At that time, I'm in a session with the Wee Wee Papa Girls on Jive Records and Samantha Fox on Jive Records. We're doing two sessions at one time. And um, that's actually, the Samantha Fox session was actually where I created the Gonna Make You Sweat guitar sound. That bam, bam. Um, but I was working on her record. And what studio was that all happening at? When that was at Jive Studios now. Jive Studios Records, their remixes come to our studio. They introduce us. We're working. And we were producing because it couldn't be a remix. I think we were producing those records. And they sucked. That was the first time I was in the studio and I turned around. What do you mean they sucked? What do you mean? I had the records up 
I had the grooves up. I have the guitar sound doing a different line. And I'm listening to it. And I'm looking at my cousin. I'm saying, did I burn out? I listened to both rooms and I said, bro, these records suck. Like, did I lose it? And my cousin is like, no, no, no. You just need some air. I'm like, no, bro. I think that we just worked so much that I'm burnt out. He's like, Rob, take it easy. So I remember like really being shot because I got the seven digit publishing deal. I got the money in the bank and I'm doing these records. And in my ears, I was like, these records are horrible, you know, and they're my groove. So I'm telling myself, yo, you're whack. So I end the session and I call my friends and it had to be a Monday night because I ended up in the China Club. And Monday nights is where Hex Hector used to play in the China Club, another one of my favorite DJs. Another gentleman, awesome mixer, always cool. I meet him through his cousin, Tracy Delgado, who became my personal assistant and, and a close family member. And she said, this is my cousin, Hex. That was before, but we're, we're up, you know, I'm pushing it back. So I go and I did like six shots of tequila. I'm sitting down and I'm watching the dance floor and Hex is doing his thing and I'm taking one shot at a time. And I remember sitting there and Hex rocks, set it off. And the crowd is rocking and I'm hearing, do 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 da do do da do do And my, that tequila is hitting me and I'm like, bam, 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 bam. Bam, bam, da, bam, bam. And I'm like, yo, I'm back <laughs> in like two hours with six tequilas. It's like, I'm back. <laughs> you know, so I call my uh, manager. At that time, it was Barbara Warren Pace. And I said, you got to book me a studio tomorrow because I have this idea in my head and I don't want to forget it. I'm at Access now. I'm working with Alan Friedman. Alan Friedman was a blessing and a curse because he was a blessing because he was one of the baddest programmers in the world but a curse because I used to program my drums. And he's the one that said, put your drum machine down, watch what this computer does. And instead of me learning that, he just made my life easier. And I was like, well, I don't have to do this no more. Now I just have to write the ideas. So it's a curse because I should have kept on, you know, doing my thing. Um, But I don't miss it. You know, it's just a, more of a passion thing. But I go in and I recreate the drums for Set It Off. And I throw the guitar on and I go, man, it's not working the way it worked in the club. You know, it doesn't have that thing. So I'm sitting there and I'm, uh, I tell Alex, Alex, you play drums? I mean, Alan Freeman. I said, Alan, you play drums? He's like, yeah, man, I love playing live drums. Okay, cool. I got this concept. I don't know if it's crazy, but I want to put two drum beats together. And Alan's, Alan's always in for anything that's unachievable. <laughs> so Alan goes, that's a good idea. I said, you sure, Alan? He's like, yeah. I was like, but this is what I want to do. I want the drums to sound gritty. I want them to sound almost like we sampled a James Brown sample, but it's not a James Brown sample. And, and, and he's, a, he's anybody that knows Alan Freeman, he's just a sonic freak. So he's like, I love that idea. And that's where we came in with the boom, bat, 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 boom, bat, boom, bat, 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 boom, bat, 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 boom, bat, boom, bat, 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 and just the thing just went woo. I put the two drum beats together, the guitar, and it was just like that is the bomb. <laughs> and uh, Bobby, who played the guitar? It was the sample. It was the, remember I told you I created the sample in the in the in the um. Samantha Fox record that sucked. Yeah. I had to, I made the sound. The sound was with three different samples that I put together and blended. And back then you made samples, you made your own stuff. I said, I'm gonna take this sound, I'm gonna take that sound, I'm gonna get the bottom of this sound, I'm gonna get the mid range, the eyes of this. Boom, I have it in stereo. So it was a sound that I created. So it's a culmination of three sounds, basically. Three sounds that I blended together, mixed it one for the bottom, one for the middle, one for the top, put it in stereo, and left it like that, and then closed it in, and it's rocking. When the when the when we 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 recreated the live drum loop through the program loop, that's what creates because it's two beats in one with the guitar. Then I call Paul Pesco, right? That played on Madonna, plays for Jellybean. I met him through Jellybean a long time before. He comes in. I go, listen. I just want you to double the sound, and I want a left and a right. I want a left one sound, right the other sound. And he was kind of like, but well, the sample sounds pretty dope by itself. I was like, bro, just you know. I want a guitar. <laughs> He's like, enhance it. Enhance it. 
Right. So we put a we we do one guitar sound on one side, one guitar on the other side, and the sample is right in the middle, and that becomes the sound that's the gonna make you sweat sound. Um, funny thing, the record is done. I call Martha. She comes in. She said, Martha, you're not gonna be singing too much. She's like, why? Because I'm doing this on my own. All right, give me give me five notes. All right, boom. Boom. Here's the chorus. Come on, let's sweat. Let's triple it. Done. All right, you're done. That's it, Rob? Yeah, that's it. Back then, I don't do it anymore. But back then, sometimes for a little feeling good, you uh, use a certain, give you an enhancement in life. <laughs> I don't want to say what it is, but everybody knows. So I sit back. Do it, put the notes on the emulator, and I just started. And that's how the whole thing comes about. I just laid it out exactly the way I heard it, gets done. The rest is for the documentary. <laughs> for no, that's cool. Movie. No, that was really cool because that's nice. And and is David Cole in there as well? No, David, Cole, David Cole's not in the session because the record, I was originally producing it for a group called Trilogy. And Trilogy and was a member, Kenny Diaz, he grew up with my brother on 28th Street and he begged me to sign the group. So while I was working on Samantha Fox and, and uh, Wee Wee Papa Girls, they were hanging around to get the deal. You know it, you know how it is in the music industry. Everybody's connecting, let's hang out, let's go. So the original idea was for them. They thought it was too pop. When I told them to do the rap, they were like, that's too pop for us. And I told them like two or three times, yo, this record is dope. Nah, we need something a little street. I said, are you sure? <laughs> they said no. So it went from being a trilogy record, it was going to be a Robert Clavillis solo album. This all happened in two weeks. And David was working on something at that time, so he didn't come in the studio because he was working on something at that time. And I'm sitting in Access, and I go, man, I don't want to do this by myself. You know what I mean? It's like it, the, the solo record came in a week, like, yeah, I could do this. Which, if I would have done that album by myself, that would have been a whole different perspective on Robert Clavillis as a producer songwriter, right? Um, but I said, nah. I called David. I said, yo, David, I got this song. I want you to check it out. I was excited because Francois came in, and he was the only one that listened to the record and said, you just did something new, right? And I was like, you think so? He was like, yeah, and you know Francois, you know what I mean? Oh, he's theoretical. He's got he, that he, thing, yeah, he's got that, that left field thing, you know what I mean? So yeah, when he's, and he's he says it it is, too, yeah. and he says it. Yeah, and he was the only one that came in and said, <laughs> so I was kind of like, bet, you know? I called David to come in. I said, yo, I rock this record. I want you to listen to it. My cousin had already come in, Ricky Crespo, who later became a programmer in our crew. Um, Alan Friedman, I brought him into Alan Friedman. I told Alan Friedman to teach him something. Um, he came in, he didn't really like it. He was kind of like, yeah, he did what Trilogy did. Yeah. And I was starting to get upset because, you know, when you got something hot and people are just kind of sliding it down and then David comes in and he listens to the record. He's like, and I'm like, <laughs> and he's kind of like, it sounds like a record that you kind of wanted to make a hit. So I'm like, what? <laughs> I was I was waiting for him to go, yo, that's dope. You know, he was like, so I had David Cole, Ricky Crespo, Duran Ramos, Kenny Diaz, and Angel DeLone from Trilogy going, eh. And Francois coming and going, yo. And I vetoed all of them right at the spot and took Francois, yo, and turned around and said, this record, and I said it not knowing it yet, just being, you know, that bravado, Puerto Rican, yo, bro, this is dope. This record is going to pay for all your food for the rest of your life. I said that just to be sarcastic. They were like, you really think so? I remember that to the day. The day. I was like, all right, whatever. We play it for Tommy Matola, just the music, and Martha. Trilogy said no. Robert Clavilla sound for a week. Eh. David, come. I want to work on a project. Let's just get this done. To Tommy Matola does what Francois does. 
he's like, there's something new about this. I'm giving you an album deal from the first listen. So Larry says, yo, Robert, he's going to give you an album deal. And then he says, put him on the phone. Hey, this is Tommy. Hey, what's up, Rob? What's up, Tommy? Now I got time to talk on the phone. You know, back then, that was a big call. You know, that's the bat phone. <laughs> and he goes, how much do you want for the album? And I just threw a number. Just I said, eh, 275. Okay, can you have the record done in six weeks? And I was like, sure. <laughs> you know, you're not going to say no, right? So we broke that album down. I looked at David. And we broke that album saying, I'm going to do the A side and you're going to do the B side. You know, I told them it was going to be a Robert Clavillis album. It was going to be a trilogy album. So I want to be able to do what I feel on one side. And you should be able to do what you feel on one side. But we'll work with each other. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, you, I start this, you start that. We walk into the room and we just do whatever. So I had David do one keyboard, I'm going to make you sweat. And that's the sax. That, -na 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 that was it because everything else was done um, on sweat. And that is the way CNC Music Factory became CNC Music Factory. But the name was another little discussion. Because while we're doing the album and we're getting in dungeon in those six weeks, you know, now it's not Robert's project anymore. Now it's Robert and David's project because we're deep, deep in it and we're working together. So David goes, let's call the album Byron and Manuel. And I was like, Byron and Manuel? He's like, yeah, that's my middle name, and that's your middle name. I was like, absolutely not, bro. <laughs> I was like, you know, he was like, man, I think we should. I was like, nah. And we left it alone. We're having a meeting with Donnie Aino, who's president of Columbia Records, Tommy Matola, Larry Asgar, Barbara, and David, and we're in the office of Sony. And um, I'm thinking while we're talking there, we're talking about the record, they love it. Uh, can't wait for the album to be done. The record's going to be released in a few weeks. I think it was at the end of November, December, something like that. And um, I take my shot. I go, Donnie, we're having a bit of a problem. He goes, what's the problem? Well, somebody wants to call this project Byron Emanuel. And he went, Byron Emanuel? I said, hold on. Being that I wanted it as a solo record, I was really wanting to be recognized as an artist. It was my moment for it to be recognized as an, art, as an artist. So just like two Puerto Ricans of Black Man Dominican came out with who was on it, I was like, that I should call it CNC Music Factory. What do you think? He was like, absolutely. I said, because it's a project to introduce people that have been around but never recognized. So those are the older artists. And then we're going to feature new artists. And that's why we should call it Music Factory, because everybody coming in will change in every album. And that's how it became CNC Music Factory. Not Byron and Manuel? <laughs> no. I don't know if I would have lived up to that name. But, you know, hey, I mean, everybody has a bad day. <laughs> David Cole could have a bad day like Robert has. Everybody. Look, look, and, of course, we all know the success and, uh, and the glory that comes, you know, these two become the, the, the let's put it like this, the man of the hour, both of them. I mean, because after that, not too far down the road, Clive Davis brings you. Yeah. Yeah, That's I mean, another thing. Mariah, you're talking about Don Einer. These are top, the top guys of the of the major labels. Tommy Mottola was the man. He was the guy. Tommy Mottola was married eventually to Mariah Carey, and then of course becomes head of Sony. But who we yeah. wrote? Don't, don't forget the Bodyguard album. But right after the CNC Music Factory album, we write write songs from Mariah Carey on the Emotions album. The lead song called Emotions album is a song we write. Make It Happen is another song we write. We also wrote on the next album. Those records together sold 50 million records. So I know that a lot of people, a lot of remixers, and a lot of producers always put sold 250 million records. But I don't think that they really uh, explain it correctly. So what's the difference between Clavillis and Cole? and some of our colleagues. And this is with respect. If you remix on a record, 
you're not getting paid producer points. You're not getting paid songwriter royalties. Got me? You're being getting paid a fee. So the difference, because some people have asked me this, so I'm gonna answer it here because I haven't said anything in 15 years. The difference between Robert Clavillis and David Cole and his colleagues is that we actually wrote, arranged, and produced on albums that have sold 250 million records and we've been paid for 250 million records. Not a fee, but an ongoing royalty. And I want to explain that to the crew because a lot of people misadvertise themselves as sold that we've been a part of. There's a big difference. And I just want to make sure I clear that up. So let me make sure everybody understands how clear this is. Remember that million dollar deal he got? From that, was, that was that was that that has now become that was recouped within minutes after the record. You know what? That was beautiful, right? Because we took this million dollar deal and within a year we sell six million records and six million CNC singles as well. Um, so that was well recouped. And we're getting publishing checks. And by the time we get to Mariah Carey, it's, it's just going so, into a different stratosphere. And again, it's a blessing, like you said. And of course, Clive Davis comes to the picture because they meet the Franklin and all that stuff. And, you know, everybody's yeah. seen, you know, they always say this, success breeds success. And nobody's silly to the fact that you guys are all over the radio, all over the friggin' map, all over MTV, all over everything at that time. What's the phone call from Clive Davis all about? I mean, you know, there's a lot of Oz calls, right? <laughs> the Wizard of Oz, right? Oz is calling, right? You got Larry LeVan that called. You have Tommy Mottola that called. And I'm going to throw Larry Yasgar in there too, because without Larry... I'm going to say this, without Bruce Carbone, let me point that out, without Bruce Carbone introducing us to Larry and Larry saying, do whatever you want, because that was the magical line. Because from that line, every record that you hear Clivellis and Cole do is what we want. We're not now working for someone's record or fixing someone's record. We are creating, we are writing, we are arranging. No one's playing anything on our records on their own. There's not a guitar player that comes in and plays what he feels like it. There's not a bass player that plays he feels like it. Because I've heard this before and I want to kill that myth. There's no horn players that come and play they feel like it. Every single thing you hear. And this is something else that separates us from everyone else. Everything that you hear in our record is our arrangements, are our parts, are our creation. And that's something that I'm saying proud, not to diss or disrespect anyone, but be proud because we came from the DJ culture, but we now wrote and arranged and created magnificent arrangements that was for the DJ to be exposed and be identified as music makers. You know, music creators. We're not just people behind keyboards and, and and turntables playing for people. We make music just as good as the best of them out there. Okay, so a funny anecdote. Ready? Here's a funny question out of nowhere. Favorite foods in the studio for both of you? Dave. The sour cream and the. We lost you. Say it again. David Coles was BBQ. And pop, always with the baked potato, sour cream, bacon, you name it. And then Popeyes introduced me to Popeye. Um, we were in the studio, you're eating fast food. You there? We're kind of losing you from the Wi Fi. Hang on. We heard Popeyes, you got introduced to BBQ. David Cole. David Cole, yeah, BBQ was David's favorite. But somebody mentioned something else that he liked, something so simple that he liked to run out and get real simple food. Do you remember what that would have been? Well, he did BBQs a lot. Popeyes, which one are you talking about? He likes to go run downstairs and go grab from the one of those stands. Tell me. Hot dog. I mean, I never seen him do that one. Mm. Me, I've never seen him do that. He was always BBQ. Maybe he ate the hot dog downstairs. I mean, I mean, I would love. <laughs> so 
Clive Davis of the Wizard of Oz, because I mean, you're you, you know, at this point, you're you guys are the top of the class, you know. And they talk about I mean, people, writers like David Foster and writers like that. You're at that league now. Yeah, you're making, you're making records that are. There's a famous know, picture. Okay. There's a famous picture that we have that it's uh, album of the year for the Bodyguard, and it's David Foster, L.A. Babyface, Bobby Brown, um, Narada Michael Walden. We're all there together celebrating the, the success of that record. Um, but Clive Davis and Tommy Mottola were both, you know what I mean? And Doug Morris, right? Those were the three musketeers right there. And you had them all in your pocket. Well, I never got to work for Doug Morris. The two out of three you did. Two out of three, yeah. I think that we didn't work with Doug Morris because that's who Larry worked with at Atlantic Records. And when he left to Vendetta and went to Sony, we just missed that boat of working with him. <laughs> so, but I know you, you know, we talk about also you work with Whitney, I'm Every Woman, all those. We work things. with Whitney, we work with James Brown, we work with Luther Vangels, with George Michael, with Michael Jackson, Mariah Carey, Lisa Lisa, Cover Girls, um, Jim Carrey, Spike Lee. Uh, it's the who's who. It's the I who's think, who of everybody. I mean, there was many more. I don't okay. know. Okay. Everybody asks me all the time, I always ask the same question. What was it like working with the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin? <laughs> Tell us that story of that deeper record. I mean, first of all, Deborah Cooper, the original singer of Deeper Love, destroyed that record, right? That was a record that we all sat down and worked on until it was perfect, right? Um, it's an anthem that still plays to this day for every culture, every race, every sex. Pride of Deeper Love is a, is a record for them. Um, I suggested that record to Clive Davis as a remake one day, and he kept it in mind. And Sister Act, the movie Sister Act, was coming out with Whippy Goldberg. And that was when Clive called and said, hey, we could do this record with Aretha Franklin. So you already work with Whitney. You already work with Mariah, but now we're going with the Queen. <laughs> and you're getting excited. And a record like Pride of Deeper Love, I can already envision it in my head. I'm like, oh my God, this is we we taking this somewhere else. So the vocal session goes on. She does a take. And you know, yeah, that's good, you know. And she's walking over to the coat rack. And I'm like, man, let's do take number two. And she was like, mm, you know, we're done with that. And I was like, you know, David is like, no, no, we can make it better. You know, let's just take another take. And she's putting on her fur coat. And she tells David, honey, it's good the way it is. <laughs> so the vocal you hear is one take. Um... I'm going to be truthful. It was one of the most unsatisfied projects because when you're going to work with someone like Whitney Houston, I mean, Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, you want the vocals to be bang. You know, this is the gospel queen of gospel queens, you know, the history, right? Um, so I was a little sat dissatisfied because I thought that she could have done so much better, you know? And I know that seems a little odd from people saying Aretha Franklin could do so much better, but you got to look at it from the producer's perspective, the songwriter's perspective, the, the delivery that Deborah Cooper gave that, the soul that you feel. And now you're working with the queen of soul. You want that feeling to go to the next level. And um, great record. We got nominated for R&B Grammy, you know, that year with it. But um, I got OCD, Lenny. <laughs> you know, everybody else liked it. And I like it. It's just... Pride of Deeper Love is one of our babies. It's, no, it's a, hard. It's, it's tough. A, it's, it's a tough. beautiful lyric. And when someone tells you Whitney Houston, right? I mean, that's why I keep saying Whitney Houston. When someone tells you Aretha Frank is going to come sing your song, and you know she's one of the gospel queens of all time, you and Pride of Deeper Love is like, come on, let's kill this. And uh, we just caught on one of those days where it was like, honey, you're getting one take and that's it. You know, I'm, I'm wanting to ask you, what was it like for you to deal with all this wonderful stuff going on and all this great stuff and your partner now gets to a position where his health is failing? Yeah, I wanted to make sure that I talk about David 
and you know that's important. People want to know what that was like. I want to make sure that I do do that. Um, I met David, and we were two regular kids with a dream that became family, and true family. You know, I got to know everything about David. David got to know everything about me. And no matter who tried to pull us apart within that success, it never worked. Um, uh, and people have tried, you know. But David is one of the most talented keyboard players I've ever experienced playing keyboards. Just to explain to you how good David was. David could play two different lines on two different keyboards from top to bottom, eat and talk to you at the same time. Now, I never seen anybody do that but David Cole. You know, David Cole also created his sounds. You know, the famous organ, that's his sound. You know, you know when David played. He had a signature playing. You know, you knew when that was David, whether he's on a Bruce Forrest record, whether he's on a Shep Pettibone record, whether he's on any record. You know, when it's solo time, you hear David's talent. David was also the guy with the million dollar smile. And he was also the guy that was always happy, right? Always happy. You see that smile? That was David 24-7. I was the serious guy in the studio getting the work done. And David was kind of like, let's live life. <laughs> um, so it was uh, a sad day. I remember the first day that he fainted because I didn't know, you know that he had uh, the disease. Um, he fainted in Do You Want to Get Funky videos, uh, video uh, shoot in California from a beast thing. And that's kind of when everyone told me because he ended up in the hospital and, you know, they ended up following. But they hadn't told me uh, till then. So there was a lot of emotions running through me, you know, because it's kind of like you should have told me. Um, but you know what? You get into the thought process of if that happened to me, how I would react, it would be a different reaction, but you got to respect everyone's thing. Um, and, and, and that's the way he chose it. Um, it's one of the reasons why I stopped making records. I think a lot of people don't really know why I stopped making records after David passed away because I did, but it didn't have anything to do with making music, you know, just for everyone to know, um, I own, almost 80% of the Cliver Lesser Cole song catalog because I wrote songs and that's how many songs I wrote. So that's not why I left the music industry. And I left on Robbie Rob's Bariqua anthem, a big, huge, iconic hit that plays till today. That is not why I left. I left because after David Cole passed away, there was things to pay, right? You know, there was a $2.5 million recording studio that we created and with the disease that he had, he wasn't insured. And I didn't know that he, was, he wasn't insured because we were supposed to take an insurance out on each other. Um, I just want to make sure that's clear because a lot of people think that David passed away, Robert can't make no music no more. Now, spinning back to my experience with him, I learned a lot from David while he was sick. It's actually another reason why I left the music industry because David was the loved one from the duo. I was a serious guy. I was the one that sat down in the contract, said yes or no. I was the guy that went in there from the drum machine, from the drum pattern, to the mastering of the record, to the editing of the record, to the overdubs. Um, uh, that's not taking anything away from David because David was there with me through thick and thin, through the whole thing. He did background harmonies. He taught me how to write records, right? He pushed me when he did that cover girls, he pushed me to become a songwriter. So there's many things that we helped each other and helped each other through thick and thin, a marriage, right? Thick and thin, that's real friendship that you can go through both and yet remain close. So when David ended up in the hospital, that's where I learned the lesson. I was working on the second CNC Music Factory album because he uh, he um, uh, ended up in the hospital during that Do You Want to Get Funky shoot. So I had to finish the record on my own. But at the before 7, I had to show up to the hospital because I would visit him every day. And I would sit down uh, with him in the hospital. And that's when you see reality. You know, I would sit there. A lot of people don't know this, but David was blind for the last two weeks of his of his life. He, he had an operation in his brain 
uh, to try to take some liquid out and it ended up blinding him. And uh, I'm sitting in the hospital with him and he's going back on everything that was going on. And he still thought he was gonna get better, but we all know that when you have that illness, you know, at that time there was no cure for it. And I'm sitting there and I remember looking at him going, here's one of the most loved guys in the music industry in the club world. Everybody loves this guy. Yet, I don't see anyone here in this room. I see a balloon. I see a phone call. But no one's here. So what lesson did he teach me? The lesson that my mother told me when I was younger. Life is short. And you can't work it all away. You have to enjoy life. And sitting there watching him blind, uh, just was an eye opener. The conversations that we had were great, right? They were great because uh, a lot of things were answered, you know. Um, I never brought up what was going to happen after he passed away. Like I mentioned, the financial and all that, because that's not important at the end of the day. You know, what's important is, is what we did together. And I knew that I could survive it. I'll handle it, you know? So it was important for me not to really talk too much about it because what he left me with, I had to deal with, and it wasn't important. You got to concentrate on the good things he did. And uh, when he passed away, I got dropped. CNC Music Factory got dropped from Sony Records the day I was burying David Cole. The same day. So just people know that. So that was a big one. Because I'm sitting there going, man, the way people look at this situation, you know. You know, I created Gonna Make You Sweat. Here we go. Let's rock and roll. Things that make you home. And they're dropping me because my partner passed away and they got it. You know, whatever the communication through the music industry is, it's kind of wrong. You know what I mean? But that's okay. Um, yeah, I got to stop talking because I'm not going to be able to finish it if I keep going. But all I can tell you is, is that David Cole is... Okay, okay. Yeah. What was the fallout for you to deal with when he was gone? The fallout the financial is... Financial fallout. Like, how does that work for you now? Because you're sitting there going, oh, shit. Now it's like... Well, it was a war. It was oh, right. snap. It was oh, snap. But who cares? My boy is dying. So it's a struggle because you can't bring it up to him. But I'm wondering why my management and my attorney that knew all this time didn't hit me before we created this $3 million studio. That's kind of where the financial thing is, is we created this $3 million studio. And the whole object and the idea was, let's take out an insurance on each other because this is a lot of money. And if something happens, we leave each other with a gift to continue. Well, during that time while we were doing the construction, we took our insurance test, right? You have to take a test. And his came back. I remember my my manager telling me, um, hey, they found a little fungus in David's blood. They're going to retest them. And, you know, you're working on seven records at the same time and you're going all over the place. Hey, just take it over and let me know, Barb. So the point is that there came a time where they knew that he couldn't be insured, but no one told me, you know, we're still working away. And then... Um, if I'm in David's shoes, hey, I'm going to get better. You know what I mean? But the other guys should have said something. Not They didn't have to say anything. They just said, don't build a studio. <laughs> something, stop. But no one said stop. So we're building the studio, and then David gets sick. Um, in so hindsight, in hindsight, why do you think they all kept quiet? Because you've had a lot of time to analyze. Knowing, knowing you, I know you. You're you're a forward thinker and you're a real deep thinker. You had a lot of time to think about everything. Yeah, um, I don't think it was anything meant to be in the wrong way. You know, I I put you got to put yourself in my shoes, right? How about if a doctor told me what I had? You know what I mean? You know, you're you're in shock. But I'm not talking about David. Right. I'm talking about why did everybody keep maybe, quiet? Maybe, was it financial maybe. reasons? No, no, maybe David. No, maybe David got the news and he said, I'll tell Robin my own time. You know what I mean? It's, it, you know how, you know how it is. There's people that have gotten sick and they just don't want to tell anybody, you know, it, it doesn't make them 
doesn't make it bad, you know. I mean, I've never been at that point, right, where a doctor says you got a clock on your life. So, and it doesn't matter, Lenny. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Um, what matters is is that Ray, uh, David was a beautiful human being, one of the most talented in the music industry and club world, a fixture, an icon, a family member, and that's really all that's important. Now, what I want to make sure is clear is that after he passed away and I got dropped from the music industry. I could have done what Puff Daddy did. You know, I could have went and created an album and continued and showed everybody the world, but that's not where I was emotionally. Emotionally, my brother died. Emotionally, the banks froze my money for a few weeks. And emotionally, I had to sit down with the bank and explain to them how I'm going to pay back $2.7 million that I now have inherited from my partner passing away. Um, and my concentration is... Rob, you know how to make music, but you're not going to make music while you have this big thing in front of you because something is going to fall and it's not going to be the music. So with the way my mother brought me up, sitting in the hospital with David, watching him about to pass away at 32 years old, you know, um, he just built this beautiful home that he would never live in. He just built a studio that he would never work in. All that just hit me. And I said, I'm not going to be in that hospital bed experiencing all this hard work and you're all alone sitting in a bed. And I'm not going to do it. I said, I'm going to roll up my sleeve, a few projects, you know, when you're back. Well, it's actually the Wi-Fi on your end. It stops. Oh, where, where, did I, where did I stop at? You said, I'm not going to be in that hospital bed. Right. I'm not going to be in the hospital bed experiencing what he experiences. When I lose my life, I want to be around people that absolutely love me. Right. David was around with people that loved them, but it wasn't. You know what I'm saying? You're famous and you got all these so-called friends. <laughs> now, no, we're, it's like no. a Teddy Pendergrass song. We're all my friends now. Right. And that's what I learned from sitting there. And oh, I said, how I'm, Melvin, I'm sorry. How I'm, Melvin. Right. And I said, that's I don't want to be that way. When I pass away, I want to be around people who love me. So with that in mind, with the depth that came to me in mind, I said, I got to put my business skills to work and I got to stop making music until then. And then I'll make music when I'm done. So that's what I did. I worked on the studio, called little Louie up, said, hey, I got a new SSL board. You don't got to give me anything for it. Just continue the payments. Really? That became the masses at work as a cell board. <laughs> you know, I brought her powers in, opened up House of Sound, and took seven, and it took me seven years to pay back everything, but I never claimed bankruptcy. I paid all my debts. And then I did this group called Rock Your Body, my check one, two, which uh, started blowing up. And then I got caught up into the politics of Monty Littman and Universal Records and Tommy Mottola <laughs> leaving Sony and coming and he's got a hit. But um, one of the best productions happened in, the, in between all that. I met my wife eight months after David passed away. I had my first son. Then I had my daughter. Then I had another son. And then I had another son. And that completely changed the perspective of my whole life. And that's probably why I said, I'm going to live. <laughs> you know, I look back and I said, I have done things that many people haven't been able to achieve. How many, how many Grammys have you won? Nominated for three and won one. How many American Music Awards? Five. Five. Five MTV, five American Music Awards, and five Billboard Awards. About 50 ASCAP Awards. Um, don't hang one up in my wall. Everybody knows that I don't have any of my things up on the walls. In fact, I don't even own them anymore. What would you do, hawk them? No. I'm joking. It's a joke. It was a joke. <laughs> I, put them, I put them in my basement, and little by little, I put them in a dumpster. The only one that has one of my awards is my son that didn't know I made music until he hit about nine years old and he goes into the basement. Well, he why? Looks, hold why on. He, he goes into the basement. He goes into a box and he pulls out the Whitney Houston Grammy. He says, hey, dad, why is your name on this? 
<laughs> and, I, and I told him, oh, I used to make music. He was like, that's why my teacher asked me, um, what does your dad do? Because his name is Clavillis. So his teachers are my age. So they look like, is, is your dad like Robert Clavillis, Robert Clavillis? Can he be the same guy who was part right. of it? And my kid is so young that he doesn't know what they mean. It's like, hey, my teacher said hello. And I would be like, what did you tell your boys and daughter what you were doing for an occupation, entrepreneur? What did you say? Later on, later on. No, I was just dad. You know, I started having- No, of course. But I mean, we get to the point, dad, what do you do? Well, my kids- well, guess, well, guess what? My kids kind of didn't know what I did because that's exactly what they said. Dad, you don't do anything. You're just always around. Like, what the <laughs> hell are you the other fathers go to work at the bank? You know and, I was, and I was kind of like, well, isn't that cool that I'm here? He said, no, no, we love it, but we just don't know how you pay for bills. Like, we live in this house. We have these friends, and they ask me, how's your dad? And we don't, like, why are they asking, how's your dad? I was like, oh, that's because they're my age, and they probably know a, a few things. But my son was the one that came up with the Grammy at nine years old, said, yo, your name is on this. This is Whitney Houston. What is it? I was like, oh, that was a record I worked on. He says, can I put it on my desk? And he put it on his desk. And as they grew up, then they started looking at Google, and they were like, yo, dad, you did pretty good. I was like, yeah. He says, why don't you talk about it? I was like, well, I'm a full-time dad, I'm a full-time husband, and that is one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life, and that's what's important. I don't need to have things on the walls when people walk to see what I did. That's not why I did it. I didn't do it for that. I remember I remember the first time that I was distasteful for an award that I won. Now, so we're saying that I'm blessed to have won everything that I won, but when we were in CNC Music Factory, we were up for Best New Artist of the Year. And we dominated that time. And we lost to Mark Cohen. You know, that was a lesson to me. Like, who is Mark Cohen? Like, in 1990. And that became so distasteful to me that it was kind of like, okay, so you can manipulate you know, who wins. And it's not based on sales. You still there? Oh, not based on sales. I'm taking this all in. Not based on production. Not based on being played all over the world. You're number one across. And Mark Cohen wins Best New Artist. From that day forward. Everybody stand up. Who the hell remembers Mark Cohen? Because nobody I, remembers. And I remember. I remember the moment that he won. I clapped the hands because I was like, okay, the TV's showing us and all that. And the minute that they went to the next award, I got up and I said, that's it. I'm not interested in the awards. That's not it. And so, and I'm not the type of guy that wants to walk in a room full of awards. That doesn't do anything for me. That's not what I got into this for. I got into it for the love, for the passion, you know, the the way it makes me feel. I got in, you know, these songs are my babies. They're like kids, you know? Um, and the minute that I saw my kids being abused or that one of them could be abused, I was kind of like, eh, you know? Um, and I did. I came out with Staggerly, Roll With MVP, that was added to MTV, on Z100, on KTU. I created the group Most Valuable Players, which got signed to Tommy Casablanca's first signing. And he caught, and this is the thing I want everybody to know. From the day that he dropped me on the burial of David, I did not speak to Tommy Mottola all the way till 2007 that I did this project and it's playing on Z100, KTU, top 10. Then I get a call and he goes, hey, it's Tommy. Now, there's a lot of different ways I could have answered that phone. <laughs> but I may believe- let's, like give it the, let's give it the angry one. <laughs> First, what? <laughs> I didn't even do that. I, I acted like- Hey, what's up, Tommy? Because it's nothing personal. It's only business. And we all had to eat that shit. And it's you only business, but I had kids. I was a full time, you know, I was living my life, you know, something that was important. So having this record, a lot of people don't know, but that was my first record back after paying all my bills, right? Um, done. Colin Clavillis is closed. Every penny is paid back. I haven't been around for a minute, right? What, 2000, I'm going to say 2007, uh, no, 1997 to 2007. That's 10 years, I'm not around. I come out with this one record. It ends up on BET. 
Then the next record goes on KTUZ 100, one of the most requested records. Tommy Lee, uh, well, they say he left Sony, but he was asked to leave Sony. Let's correct that. And he goes to Casablanca and he calls me up that I have a top rec 10 record on the radio. <coughs> and he says, I want it. He did the same thing as the CNC album. How much do you want for the album? I said, give me 350. You got it. Now, the only difference is, this is the thing. In my mind, I'm going, this is Tommy's first record on Casablanca. He's going to go all out for this single in my head. I'm coming back. This is my first record. Stag is getting really good reviews. Another top 10 record. When you when you have a record of top 10 on Z100, you know where it's going. You know what I mean? That's a pop station. CHR, crossover hit radio. Right, it's top 10. There's getting 76,000 calls a day just to show you where this record was. So in my head was, I'll give it to him. Let bygones be bygones. It became so a regret. Why? I put it out, but there's a new guy called Monty Lippman that's working for Doug Morris. He's running Universal. His brother runs the distribution. They have a record called Baby Bash. So I put this record out. It gets 30 ads the first week with Tommy. Yeah, this is going to go great. I said, man, this is dope. It gets added to MTV Top 10. It beats out Justin Timberlake's Rock With You. It goes with Rocket Body versus Rock With You with Justin Timberlake. MVP beats him out on the video picks. Um, so this record was serious. All of a sudden, next week, 20 ads. All of a sudden, the following week, 15 ads. is going down. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. My girl, Michelle Visage from Seduction, is now working at radio. She calls me up and says, Robert, there's a Monty Lippman calling all radio saying Baby Bash is the priority, not rock your body. Be careful. So I call Tommy. Yo, who's this Monty Lippman? You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, he's like, well, you know, he works for Doug Morris. He's running Universal, Casablanca's Universal. I said, Tommy, you're Tommy Matola. I said, you haven't spoken to me since 1997, 10 years. I gave you this record in five seconds. You need to be Tommy Matola and finish this breaking this record. No, no, don't worry about it. Da, 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 Next one, seven ads. I pick up the phone. I call Monty Lippman myself. He goes, Robert, you can come see me Friday. I'm on my way to go see him. I call Tom Pullman. If nobody knows who Tom Pullman is, he now runs Clear Channel. But he was the music that he was the music director at Z100. I call Tom Pullman. I'm on my way to a meeting at Universal. I just want to ask you before I have the meeting and, and say anything. Is Rocket Body a hit? He says, well, Gonna Make You Sweat had 90,000 calls a day or a week. Rocket Body's getting 75,000. What do you think? I was like, that sounds like a smash. He says, yes. He says, all they have to do is say it's a priority and we're good. So I said, okay. So I go to this meeting with Monty Lippman. And the first thing he says is, how could I not, as a president, want to have a hit with the famous Robert Clavillis from Clavillis and Co? All the other presidents have had hits. Why wouldn't I? And I go, great. He goes, let's move on to the second single. <laughs> so I'm like, wait a minute. The first single ain't even up. You know? Um, he goes, no, no, I think we should move to the second single. I was like, no. I was like, this is a hit. You know, we're showing him the radio research, the da 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 and as I'm sitting there and as he's talking, I'm going, man, I'm getting caught up for the first time in my life in a political situation between Monty Lippman not wanting Tommy Matola to have a hit record and Tommy Matola doesn't push the trigger. And this is going to be right in the middle of this thing. Um, long story short, they give me the album back. They give me the single back. I take it to, I think it's EMI in the UK. It goes top three pop. So I said, I had a smash all along, but it was my last record working for a major label. And then I said, that's it. I'm going to live my life through the record. Huh? His, and the rest is history. You know, a lot of great things have happened. Going to make you sweat is a 35 years and doing very, very. Well, that's a generational changing record. Fair. I've said it. That's an iconic generational record. I call it the Michael Jackson happy birthday record. It's always used, been used. It's astonishing. It's celebration. It's like it's it's a standard. It's gonna yeah, be good. I'm not gonna say how much it makes a year, but it's incredible. That's the word that I'll use of what it does 30 years. Yeah, it's it, it just keeps you don't have to ever work ever in your life. So um we missed a lot, right? I don't know what is there anything. Well, you else? got a lot, but I want to ask the last I'm gonna let because 
I'm going to leave it like ask this. Ask me whatever you want. I'm here. I'm here for you. So you ask me whatever uh, you want. Why now a documentary? Well, we're doing two. Uh, about eight years ago, I was called by E! Channel. They were doing a reality series, and they wanted to have a Latin music industry guy. And they thought that I um, was interesting because I was the only Latin guy that conquered all the engineers in music, right? Dance, pop, R&B. Um, and they thought that it was a unique situation. Um, but when I came all happy to discuss it with my wife, she shot it down. <laughs> she said they wanted to do like a Latin runs house type feeling. And uh, she said, absolutely not. I don't want my kids in the, in, you know, in the media. You know, we're good. You're doing okay. You don't need to do it. And I was all hyped up about it. But, you know, she was like, no. And everybody's been writing docs and life stories. And, you know, a Puerto Rican kid from 116th Street, you know, stick up this, that, going into the music industry, becoming successful. I thought it made a great story. So I talked to the Terrero brothers, Jesse Terrero. And it was between my life story and Fat Joe's. And when he was having the, the meeting with me, I was like, why did you call me? He said the same thing. E, it's a unique story. You, you are, if not the only Puerto Rican. I didn't realize it until he told me. He says, man, we've done a lot of work. You don't get the credit that you're supposed to get, Robert. You, have, you are the only Puerto Rican that has achieved pop global success in all genres of music. You've been in house, you've been in freestyle, you've been in pop, you've been in r and and you've conquered all of them. And you're doing all this stuff and no one really knows about you. <laughs> you know, you have this name where it's there, but it's not there and your Wikipedia is kind of there, but it doesn't really explain everything. So they were interested, but I said, listen, thank you for the dinner. And man, this is a great conversation, but I know you're gonna go with Fat Joe. <laughs> I mean, come on, it's Fat Joe, you know what I mean? So they said, no, no, we'll, you know, we'll come up with in the future. And during that situation, I was like, man, maybe I should write a book, you know? So the documentary, the purpose of the documentary, and I haven't spoken a lot about what's going on within here. Sorry, we had to limit it to a few things is because there's a lot of controversy in the creation of CNC Music Factory and gonna make you sweat and who sings and who doesn't, who knew and who didn't know and pour this and pour that. And I think that that needs to be explained um, but the documentary is going to be on my favorite creations, my top 15 global records, and it's going to give the history of everything of that record, how it became, who created, who wrote, who did it, who's responsible for this. Because within the CNC life, there is a life called Robert Clavillis. And I don't think that everybody really knows what I do. Everybody's, you know, shared what they believe it is, right? Well, I will say this, you cleared up a lot of misconceptions today. Yes, yeah, some. It cleared a lot of things up that some. really got the nitty gritty and, and microscopic vision of what was really going on. Yeah, it's really sensitive because David and I are partners and you don't want to explain what you really do and it looks, you know, things could look wrong when you're defining, well, I did this and I did that. And, you know, you get into the I did and did this. And, and that's not kind of what the documentary documentary is for. It's really for my kids. It's for my legacy. It's for people to know the value of Robert Clavillis within what became Colin Clavillis, CNC Music Factory, Seduction, Cover Girls, all that stuff. You know, what was my role? What was my role as a business person? Crew, all those great 20 records. crew to Puerto Ricans of Batman, Dominican. You know, I've been able to help. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but I helped Little Louie with Silent Morning. Um, I'm the one that brought David Cole into Silent Morning. You know, Louie called me up and said, hey, man, I got this problem. I got this record and, you know, I want to get it done. But the horns sound like the Giggles record because the original Silent Morning was bam, 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 I was like, man, they really dog Giggles. And he was like, I don't know what to do. What do you think I should do? And I told him right there on the spot. I said, let me listen to it. I remember listening to the cell phone. I said, yo, clip it. Bam, 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 clip it. And he was like, yeah, but I don't know what the keepers. I said, I'm going to call David and he's going to do the session. So that was another session that David says, bro, why do you keep throwing my name <laughs> to do these sessions? And I was like, listen, Louis, my boy. You know what I mean? He's nervous. Help him. He's a cool cat. He's talented. He's one of my favorite. Louis is one of my favorite DJs. Another oh, one. Oh, David's a, um, I'm sorry. Louis is a great DJ. Louis, Louis always been one of my favorite no, DJs. No, he delivers every time. He delivers. Absolutely. 
Little Louis called me. There's a few. I mean, that it was that. So then I put David Cole in that. And if you see Silent Morning, David Cole's in there doing keyboards. David Morales' first remix with Imagination. Another one that I had to talk David into doing because Judy called and said, he's got his first remix. I was like, but we did. We gave him two Puerto Ricans of Batman Dominican. What, you know, what's going on? Yeah, but he's doing his first remix. He's nervous. Rob, you got to talk to him. We need David Cole. And David again said, bro. <laughs> I was like, listen, you know, let's just help. It's not a big deal. He's like, yeah. But you know what? Even though David did that, you know, he he helped. You know, he he did a great job on that remix. He did a great job on Silent Morning. We all helped each other. It's, it's nothing else, you know, uh, uh, that I would be satisfied. Hex Hector, you know, another one, you know, that I helped. Um, he always says in his interviews. So thank you, Hex. Um, little Louie called me up before Silent Morning to learn how to program. So I took my 707 roll into his house and I gave him a visit. You know, I'm just saying these things because a lot of people don't know that, you know, Rob likes to help people. <laughs> Connections, also the family friendships. This is not yeah. just, it's not always about money. There's also a thing called, I want to be part of something. I want to help out. And it was never about money. You know, never did I ask for it. In anything. those days, no, it wasn't about money. It was about passion. It's about helping. Hey, you got a problem, Louis? Bet. You got this? Cool. You know what I mean? Um, but it was a lot of great times. There was a lot of people that, came out of, and I'm going to say this, there's a lot of people that came out of the Clavillis and Cole camp. You know what I mean? That became great guys. And, you know, and, and, and that's a cool thing. Not, I'm not saying it for anything other than that. I think that is, that's the coolest thing to remember. You know, the day Louie called me or the day I, I told David, let's get down. And you know what I mean? Uh, or talk David Cole into doing this for them or moving around. Because at the end of the day, those were all gems. All the records I'm mentioning are gems. Incredible, bro. I can ask more questions, but you know what? I'm going to leave it for right here where we're at. I mean, one last thing for me would be your your tenure at Palladium with, with David. I mean, you guys are doing that, killing it at Palladium. That was, that was awesome. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was a big time for you. You were in the height of your moment. Yeah, we were big. And um, Steve Lewis, good friend of mine, knew him for a long time. He's the one that said, listen. Stephen Lewis, everyone's a big promoter in New York. All the huge, huge, huge promoter. Steve Lewis is one of the most awesome promoters I know. Um, said, hey, do what you want to do. You know what I mean? And we had some great nights there. MTV has some of that film of five. MTV and this, and this brother was playing on live on Hot 97 at the same time. Or Hot One. Right. Yeah, it was. Yeah, um, it was live. They had live simulcast. It, it was before Hot ninety seven came out. I forgot what it was called. Hot one hundred three. Hot one hundred three. Tracy Clattery called us up, and I said it got to be live, and you got to let me play whatever I want. I play house. I play reggae. I play hip hop. I play everything. You're gonna have to leave it on. You know, at that time they were little with the reggae and the hip hop, and no one really wanted that. I was like, nah. I even played Sid Stairway to Heaven in between it, and they had a problem with it. But I was like, no. This, the name of the program is called Anything Goes. And you gotta let me you gotta let me play whatever I want. And they became some famous tapes, man. It's famous tapes, and it was wall-to-wall -wall sold out audience every single day. David playing live keyboards on my three turntables in a reel to reel. Um, I brought my boy from China Club, Hex Hector, you know, and always helped Hex Hector. I always wanted Hex Hector. I always he's one of my favorite DJs, and I always wanted to see him his dream come true. He came out to CNC camp too, you know. Um you know, he knew Jen, and that's how he got the waiting for tonight. You know, he met Jen through me. And um, I mean, there's a lot more stories, right? We didn't talk about Lisa Lisa. We didn't talk about all that stuff. I was going to ask about Lisa Lisa, but I mean, <laughs> we didn't, that's just too much to talk about. But you the Palladium days. Everything you hit the most important, a lot of important things, bro. But the Palladium was awesome. It was a live show. And believe it or not, during the Palladium time, Hot 103 was changing into Hot 97. And there was a DJ by the name of Funk Master Flex that played for Red Alert. And Tracy Clottery called me to the radio station and said, listen, we want him to play for us. But he's scared because he plays under Red Alert and he doesn't want to lose that spot. So they, she asked me for a favor and I'm the one that walked up to Flex where he was working. I think he was working for, I don't know if he was working for Profile Records, but he was working somewhere. And I gave him a call. I said, I'm going down. He said, all right. And we sat there and I said, listen, the station wants you. And he was like, Rob. If it doesn't work, 
I'm going to lose my job with Red Alert. Um, and I'm not going to have anything. I said, Flex, you come to High 97. And it's going to be yours. And he'll never forget that. He said, you sure? And I said, I'm positive. And we all know whatever what ended up happening with Fun Master Flex. He's still there and he's running the whole shop since then. And that's probably 1993 or 94, somewhere around right 30 there. years. And we're 30. At 24 and Flex is the man. 31 years later, still going. And I got to say that because that was a moment where I, I was Jerry Maguire for <laughs> Hot 103 for their biggest DJ, right? So there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that've been involved in that people just don't know. But when Lisa Lisa came to you, I remember you saying, "Yo, gotta lose weight, gotta get you on a certain regimen, and gotta get you right to get yeah, you." Yeah, well, out. it was every girl. That was every girl and every artist that we had. Freedom Williams, right, having that six pack and working out. That was something everybody knows that Robert worked out all his life. So um, when we created groups, not only did I write and produce and be in their studio and and work their vocals away, but it was also gym, work out, eat well, look your best. And listen, when I met Lisa Lisa, who didn't love Lisa Lisa back then when I wonder if I take you home? Come on, she was like the Latin Madonna at that time, right? So when I got a chance, it was a real tough moment because I was in Donnie Ina's office and he had one of the full force guys there. And that was the first time I saw somebody bully me into a project. I wanted to help. The full force came in. I'm like, hey, man, what's going on, man? You know, this is cool. It's going to work out good. And he's got the serious look and he's sitting down. And Diana basically says, CNC is going to make half of the album. And they're going, but we don't really need help. And Donnie's going, CNC is going to make half of the album. And it just turned my whole celebrating of helping someone out into a yo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hold on. Making an offer you can't refuse. Right. Yes. Because it was, you know what it is? She had two monstrous albums and then her third album didn't do that well. Right. So we were in this fourth, this was a make it or break it album. Right. And Lisa Lisa was a good friend of mine at that time. And uh, I came in to help. And I was rough, you know, but I was rough in the right way. I wanted you to look your best, be your best, to sound your best. And sometimes that got overlooked, right? Because when I focus, it's... Um, and uh, we did Let the Be Hit Him, which is a great record. You know, iconic record. It's kind of the hip-hop version of Do It Properly, right? Samples and grooves going into each other. Um, dope record. But when I sat in Donnie's office, I said, man, one day that's going to be us. You Bobby, know? yeah, are you gonna ever come back and make another record, or you just said, "Nah." Well, I work with Eric Cupper. You know, we got to throw Eric Cupper in here. Beautiful person. Eric's a wonderful, him. prolific keyboard player. Great producer. One, one of the one of the gentlemen of one of the gentlemen of house music. I worked with him. Um, we did a few things. Um, talented person. I think he's undercredited for the things that he's done, you know, whistle song. Um, got caught up what I was able to help David Cole with, right? Keyboard player, coming up with some fantastic stuff, been working with someone and not really getting his, you know what I mean, do, you know? And, and you got to say that lightly because, you know, everybody that he worked with was fantastic, but at the same time, Eric Cupper did a lot of gems that he didn't get credit for. Oh, yeah. And um, and uh, and he deserves his flowers. Beautiful human being. Um, Got to remember Jimmy Hester and uh, Chris Robinson. Is it Chris Robinson? He used to promote. He's now DJ. Father Chris, yeah, Father Chris. Chris I got to mention them because he told me to mention them. And you know what? They helped that a lot in the club time. Father Chris, DJ, totally. And Jimmy Hester did a fantastic job doing publicity. I, I, I got introduced to him by David Cole. Um, there's just such a bunch of great people that helped us, you know, and um, yeah. Am I making the a record? Is, so the answer is, it's a possible maybe. Well, with, doc with the documentary, I am doing a record. Oh, then okay, then there's the answer. I am working on a record. Um, it's probably going to be, I don't know if it's going to be my last one because I do, I really work part-time. You know what it is? I'm going to be honest. I love music. 
But the time that I've taken off and I'm having my kids and becoming best friends with my kids, my, my son just got married. He's 25. My daughter's getting married. And she's 23. I got a 16 year old and an 18 year old. It's just, I love, I'm back to my mother's, you know, experience with her. She, now I'm dad. And mm -hmm. I just love that ride with my wife. You know what I mean? And my kids that I, I look at life like I'm 59 years old. My time is limited. What do I want to do with it? Do I want to be in a club? Because I could be touring. You know, I could be out there playing and, and making records and all that. But when I look at the time that I got to spend on it, you know what I mean? And the, and what I got to dedicate it to it. And then, I'm, like I said, we're always going to go back to my OCD. How much time do I have left? And what am I going to do with it? Right. You know? Time management. Time I got to be sitting down with my kids, having a great conversation. Or my wife, you know, doing, just living. You know what I mean? Just taking that thing going, thank you for this gift of life. You know what I mean? Now, I love making music. So I'm making music, but they're four-hour sessions. <laughs> no more 12-hour sessions. Yeah, no you're doing a little bit here. And I'm not day. interested in having the record of the year, and I'm not going for any of that. I'm doing it purely for fun. If I'm going to get smashes, it's going to be exactly like I did with Larry. Do whatever you want to do, and it just works. What's cool about it is, I'm working with a lot of kids, right? 18, 16, 19 year artists. And I'm coming about it from a different way with them, the way I'm producing still with everything intact, but just from a more laid back situation. You know, my, it's it's like my my older son. My older son says, man, the way you treat this, the young one, the 16 now, the way you're bringing him up wasn't the way you brought me up. And I was like, well, you know, time kind of, you know, yes. I've got to chill you out and you kind of learn how to, you know, simplify things, you know? So it's the same thing with music. I've learned how to simplify it. I'm enjoying it um, because I got my son who's executive producing it and he's 16 years old and I have a blast because, you know, it's, you can have a son and go, eh, the idea's all right. You know what I mean? He's my son, cool. But when your son is coming out with some dope stuff in your head and you're going, damn, this dude's got that Clavillis thing in him. You know what I mean? It just becomes fun. You know, and that's what I'm having right now. I'm having fun watching him make a decision on a part. Um, the other day, there was an 18-year-old singer there uh, singing her vocals, and she's cutting her own vocals. These people are cool. They're self-sufficient. She's cutting her vocals, and I'm telling her, try that line, try this line, do this, do that. She's taking the notes, and then I walk away, and I'm in the other room doing my push-ups, and he's sitting there. And while I'm doing my push-ups, and she's doing the vocal, she does the line and then he goes, you know what? Why don't you try it this way? And I'm hearing him sing and I'm like, yo, that's pretty dope. You know, it's not because he's my kid. It's because he's actually doing something dope. And then she's going, yo, that's pretty dope. And then she does it. And then when I'm watching them, it's kind of like reminding me of when I was younger, but I'm still young enough to be down with them. So it's a whole different type of enjoyment. Well, that's what happens when you're in this music thing. Um, you don't get old. You know, no. You, you don't. You stay relevant and you stay youthful. No. But what's beautiful about that is, is that I'm actually sitting in a room with a child that was created by me and my wife and you're watching him. You know what I mean? It's a trip. It's a trip. You know, when you look at your kids, it's always a trip because it's like, man, like that's like a, a slight reflection of me. And the beautiful thing is that his name is Brennan Cole Clavillis. So that's pretty cool. That's very cool. You know, it's, it's a cool thing to watch that he's the one that's got the good ideas, right? Because I got four kids. My oldest is a great poet. My daughter is a beautiful writer as well. Um, my special needs, Gavin, is, I call him house man, bro, because he loves house music. It's just anything, boom, 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 and he's going. And then Brendan is hip hop and funk and soul. But uh, it's cool to see that the one that's cold, Clavillis, is the one that's kind of like making me go, yo, that's dope what you're coming up with. <laughs> and I always talk to them about their uncle, David Cole. You know, a lot of people would, you know, it would be, you know, don't forget, it's almost 30 years or 30 years, right, that he's gone. Um, but I always tell the man, if David was around, you would have so much fun with him. Because I know that if David was alive, he would be a dope uncle, you know. What a shame. What a shame you're such a great person, great friend. And we'll see each other again one day. Oh, of course. Of no course. doubt. No doubt. Yeah. I always look at people that pass away like they are, they're on a vacation and we're going to see each other soon. We're going to be all right. 
On that <laughs> note, everyone, can we thank Mr. Robert Cavillis for such an amazing in-depth interview. I'm speechless, bro. It's Man, incredible. sorry we didn't get to cover everything. I know we was... You zig- covered a lot. A hell of a lot. It's enough. Okay, I'll right. cover the rest of the documentary. I'll get into the juice juice. <laughs> Juicy juice. <laughs> juice. <laughs> I hope you all learned something from this. This is a true, another edition of True House Stories with Robert Cavillis on a special Wednesday. And we can't thank you enough, Bobby, for coming on and, you know, really giving it all of it and being so, you know, so open, bro. What, amazing. Yeah, yeah and cool. I want to make sure that all the stories that I said, they're all meant in celebration. I hope that anyone that I said anything or brought into the story, they know that it's just you're asking me something and I got to give you the facts. So. No, that's what we want. We don't want no lies. What the hell good is that going to do for us? Hey, listen, I got no problem saying I was penniless, food stamps, cheese line. I lived it all, and that's how I teach my children. You know, we got to give them the real deal. We can't fantasize things. You know, that's what keeps it humble, right? Um, There was a lot of people that helped me out. You know, I mentioned Timmy, Louie, Merlin, Bob. We didn't talk about. Um, There's just so many people, you know, so maybe next time. Until next time, children of the of the underground. Ta-ta for now. See you all next week. And we have special Mr. Jovan coming on. Thanks nice. again, Robbie. All right. Take care. Rob is amazing, bro.